Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise yeah. the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. One more time for Jesus. Amen. Let's give him a shout. Glory to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Cherie, come pray over this service, will you? Praise God. God is good. Amen. Yes. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here in this region, God, to affect these people in this region and to impart to them and get the anointing on them, God. And I just thank you that they wouldn't just take it from here tonight, but they would go and use it and, and use it on everyone that they're around, everyone that they see, God, for your glory and bring them in, God. And I just thank you that your fire would fall in here tonight, God, and that this wouldn't be the end, but it would be the beginning for many people that are here tonight, God. And I just thank you, Lord that you've anointed Pastor Ziggy for such a time as this, God, for revival, to bring revival to this nation, God. And I thank you for all that you're doing in Ohio, God. And we know it's not over, God. We know that the fires have burned for the last several months, God, and they haven't been put out, God. And I thank you that they won't be, God. I thank you, Lord, that you are redigging those wells of revival, that your promises are yes and amen, God. I thank you that every person in this room, God, would be a torch for you, God, that flame on tonight, God, that they would take it and they would light fires everywhere, God. And I just thank you, Lord, that they would know who they are, that they would have a clear direction, God, that they would know that they are anointed and appointed, that they are kings and priests that are sent by you to make an impact on this world before we come to your kingdom, God. And I thank you that your kingdom is coming to us here tonight, God. And I thank you, Lord, that you're going to continue to do all that's in your heart to do. And I thank you that not one in this room would go without what they came here for, God. I thank you, Lord, that, you're a, that your power, God, is sufficient, that your grace is sufficient, God, and that you're going to touch every individual, God, from head to toe. Every sickness has to go tonight. Every affliction has to go. I thank you, God, that every insecurity has to go. I thank you, Lord, that these people would walk in the confidence of God. I thank you, Lord, that their minds would be cleared, God. I thank you, Lord, their mind would be on you their hearts would be on you God and I thank you that they would be sent out God I thank you for the expectation God and I thank you Lord for these people tonight Lord I thank you that you're doing all that you promised in your word for us tonight and I thank you that you are such a good God and you are faithful to us Lord and we thank you for all that you have to do have your way in us in Jesus name amen praise the Lord amen amen Glory to God. Take a moment, turn around, greet two or three people, welcome them today, introduce yourself to someone new, welcome them today. We're so glad that you're here. Whether this is your first night in the revival, whether you've been here already for several nights, we just want to welcome you. We thank God uh, that you've come to join us. We're expecting the Lord to do great things in each one of you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Empty my pockets here, because if I don't, I'll play with all this stuff I put in my pockets. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, the Lord is good. Amen. And his mercy endures forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, it's been wonderful to be here with you all in these revival meetings. I'm telling you, God has poured out his spirit. He's touched many, many people. And and uh, I'm so glad for the pastors that have joined us. And uh, amen, Pastor Jerry from, uh, from Adrian, Michigan, and uh, also Pastor uh, Villanueva from uh, Swanton. And uh, we're glad that you're here. And Mark and Becky, who are ministers of the gospel, are here today. Hinojosa? Hino no, you're not Hinojosa, are you? Yes? No? What? Sanchez. How could I forget? How dumb can you get and still breathe? Thing? So good to see you guys. Amen. This is Reuben's, one of uh, Reuben's aunts. And uh, so wonderful. Yes. They're doing great work uh, for the Lord. Go and they do ministry in uh, uh, Me Mexico mostly, right? Mexico mostly. And so uh, we praise God for you all. I'm glad you're here today. Of course, all of you that are here today, we're so glad that the Lord has uh, brought us together. I'm, I'm so excited about all that God is doing. I, I, <laughs> amen. 
<laughs> you know, the Bible tells us, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither is in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Then it says this, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. Amen. For his spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Glory to God. So let the Holy Spirit give you a revelation today of the wonderful things that he has for your life. God has a great plan for your life. Uh, the plan that God has is a good plan. Amen. It's a plan to, to bless you, to prosper you, to give you a hope, to give you a future. You know, some people are like, well, you know, things are getting bad. Yeah. Bible says that uh, sin will abound, but when sin abounds, God's grace will abound even greater. Amen. And that's where my expectation is. Uh, I've I don't put my trust in princes, but I put my trust in the living God. Amen. Amen. And the Bible says he's the one that gives us richly all things to enjoy. So uh, <clears throat> once again, I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, so tonight, I, I just want, uh, yesterday, <laughs> and this happens to me a lot. If you all have been in any of the meetings for a long, especially if you've been in long revival, you know, long extended meetings, you know, sometimes I'll get to, to go to receiving an offering and then uh, I'll teach and then pretty soon we're, we're in deep and we can't get out and and, and, uh, and before you know it, it's 10 o'clock. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some people think I do that intentionally, and I really don't. I really try to just obey the Holy Ghost. But, but uh, yesterday we got, we got way in deep there. Amen. But, but I'll tell you, the, the Holy Ghost, He helped us. And so I want you to remember that uh, God, God does want to bless you. He wants to bless you big time. Amen. It's his desire uh, to bless you in every area of your life, including your finances. And so it was, it was uh, pretty cool because yesterday, um, yesterday I'd, I just mentioned something in passing about um, our, uh, the airplane that we've got. And it talked about, I was talking about, just as an example, uh, how much it costs to have the, the uh, um, cause we, we, we talked about this in uh, uh, Holland. Uh, I have a severe fuel leak in one of my tanks, but um, to get a, uh, to get to take it to someone who knows what they're doing and fix it takes a long time. And so we are scheduled to go like next month and take it in. And you know what? People have sown and they've given us every dime we need to get that done. I mean, it's we we do. Amen. So I only use that as an example. I don't really need y'all to help us with that. But I may need for you to help me with something. And, and uh, I want you to really pray with me about this because while I was up here preaching, Cherie and I, we had been talking. When we had come from, when we had left Holland uh, to go to Oklahoma one day, uh, when we came back, we told you a little story about how we kind of got uh, pinched in between some clouds and we got into some uh, stuff and we picked up a ton of ice and, uh, in this airplane. Well, I don't have de-icing equipment on the airplane that I currently have. I did on the last airplane I had, but on this airplane, we have no de-icing equipment. So when you, when you get ice like that, uh, you just have to get out and, and uh, you have to get out fast. Uh, in 30 seconds, we picked up uh, probably about three quarters of an inch of ice on the leading edge of the wing. Uh, my plane will fly with two and a half inches of ice on the wing, but we weren't about to become test pilots to make sure that that was right. So Shree and I, we got out of the ice real quick, amen. And we got on the ground, we, we took the ice off the wings and off the airplane, we took off again, we made it home uneventfully. But um, after that happened, you know, I was talking to the fellows that sold me the airplane. I said, you know, if you ever run across an airplane, because my airplane is super nice, you have to understand, the airplane I'm flying, it's, it's, uh, it's incredibly high tech, and man, I'm telling you, it's got all the, and people get in my airplane, they're like, man, this thing is nice, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, yes it is, amen. But, um, so, uh, and we, we kind of brought it up to that place um, from where it was. And it didn't take very long. It was, it was already a nice plane when I got it, super fast. Um, my airplane go uh, about, about 230 miles an hour up, up high, which is pretty, you know, it's pretty quick for a single engine piston airplane, which is, you know, anyway. So, the, you know, here we were talking about the wings and, and whatnot. And uh, I checked my phone when I got out of the pulpit, and, and I had a phone call from the fellows in Texas that sold me the airplane. And, they do a lot of work on my plane. They're a big time blessing to me. These guys are, they're awesome. They're incredible people. Uh, their ne last name is Maxwell, uh, Don Maxwell Aviation in Longview, Texas. And they do lots and lots of work on my airplane. And many times they do things and they, I never even see a bill. And, and uh, it's, uh, they, they're, they're, they're a big time blessing to me. 
And so anyhow, um, he called me, he said, hey, Zig, he said, uh, um, he said, I think I may have found you an airplane. If you, he said, are you really maybe interested in getting a different airplane? I said, well, so you can get me a nice one. I would, I would be interested. He said, well, he said, uh, we've, we've got one coming in. Um, it's, it's, he said, it's newer than yours, got a better autopilot than yours. He went through this list and he said, and it has uh, icing protection. So, and he says, and it'll carry 200, it'll carry 200 pounds more than your airplane will carry. So, I mean, all the way around, it was like, I was like, ha, ha, thank you, Jesus. Amen. So, <laughs> so he said, um, we're going to get it in a couple days. And he said, uh, if you want to come down and look at it. So next week, I'm going to fly down to Texas and look at another airplane and possibly have a new airplane uh, next week. I mean, I know that sounds crazy. It's like, mm, really? <laughs> yes, amen. But uh, so we're, we're going to ditch because we have to have that tank resealed that we'd, uh, if, if we keep my airplane. But man, if we're not going to keep it, we're not getting the tank sealed. That's a, you know, a $4,500 or so. But anyway, um, but, you know, this airplane priced seventy dollars or $80,000 more than the one that we have, so we'd have to invest that much in it. If you want to sew toward an airplane today, you sure can. And so uh, we're, we're, going to, uh, we're going to receive the offering tonight. And I'll tell you this, everything that's sewn tonight will go toward uh, every Friday night when we're, uh, no matter where we are, uh, if we're in Texas, if we're in Oklahoma, no matter where we are, if we have a Friday night service, every Friday night, every dime that comes in the offering goes toward uh, the, uh, expenses, uh, the expenses that go toward maintaining and flying that airplane. And so, uh, amen, I receive that, amen. So if you want to be a part of that, you know, if, if, if the Lord moves on your heart and you want to just take care of the whole uh, gap that we have for, you know, to buy a new airplane, um, that'd be awesome too. But uh, we definitely, uh, we are definitely open because an airplane, someone once told me, they said, oh, you know, you, oh, you got a toy. I said, that's not a toy. That's a tool. Um, now I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'll, I, do, I've in, I rather enjoy flying it. It's not that I, you say, oh, you're the pilot. Absolutely, yes. I, I mean, I, I'd put somebody else up there, but I don't know what they do in an emergency. I know what I would do, but, you know, I, I heard Lester Summerall tell a testimony of one of his engines quit, and, and uh, his, one of his pilots said, well, we're going down. And Lester Summerall was like, what did you say? <laughs> he, he ended up firing that pilot. He's like, I don't want anybody cursing my airplanes while I'm in them. Uh, I want you to say what I would say. He got up there and he began to talk to that engine and it, it restarted. Amen. <laughs> That's what I do, man. Anything happens, I'm like, in the name of Jesus. You know, <laughs> glory to God. But uh, I've been fortunate. We've had very few... Uh, uh, they say flying is uh, hours of boredom mixed with moments of terror. And uh, that's pretty much the truth. But, <laughs> but I haven't had really any terrifying moments. It, it's, I've had moments where I knew I had to do something, but it wasn't anything. I never felt like my life was right. In my training, I actually um, I had an engine failure while I was training uh, in an old 1950-something uh, uh, Cessna 170 uh, or I think it was a 170 or 172. But anyway, we ended up in a field somewhere in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, you can lose your engine and you got lots of options. Everything's flat, you know. <laughs> there's a field. You just have to miss cows. But <laughs> avoid the cows and you're good. Uh, so, uh, so early on, I, I realized that, you know, here I had this engine failure and I'm just gliding, you know, gliding through the air and uh, landed in a field. Uh, and it helped me because I thought, you know, you're not just going to fall out of the sky. If your engine quits, you'll actually glide, uh, which was pretty cool. But these airplanes that I'm flying now, they're fast. Boy, they are slippery and they are quick. Uh, I had one, I was telling them at lunch today, I had one that was, is like getting in a car. You know, you had, it felt like you were in a car and it was pretty quick. But this one I've got now is like getting in a Corvette. And boy, it, go, it goes that fast too, man. It's like a bullet and uh, sometimes hard to slow down. <laughs> Every couple of times, right, Street? Every couple of times, Street and I were coming in quick, and I had to pull the old nose up. We had to, we had to actually had to climb just to slow down, and then uh, eventually we got it. Out. <laughs> Titus is the one that freaks out. Ah! But anyway, <laughs> praise the Lord. But you know, 
um, many, many people have gathered. The, the Lord gave me word. He said, many people will join to, together to help you to accomplish what God has put in your heart. And uh, you know what? We don't, we don't need a different airplane. But this airplane is actually faster. The one that they're talking to me about It's a faster airplane. It goes a lot faster. It's normally aspirated instead of turbocharged. It's a long body. It's a big old long thing. We got uh, more space, which would really help us because we need it. But, but anyway, if, uh, if God puts something on your heart. So we'll just receive the offering right now. I don't want to, uh, you, you all know, I've, I've shared with you what the Word of God says. I could share, you know, something, you know, well, I better not. Because <laughs> if, if I get to going on something, I, I end up trying to expound on it way too much. But uh, if you're writing a check today, make your check to the church. The church has been so gracious toward us. They've been a blessing to us. And a uh, pastor and his wife have, have uh, uh, been wonderful hosts and we're grateful to God for them. And of course, we've met Brother Joe and he's a great guy. We saw, we saw a fellow walking in the mall. We thought it might be you, but we thought, no, he didn't get here that quick. Sure enough, it wasn't. He didn't have a smile on his face. So anyway, Brother Joe, it's, so, it's been so good to meet you and it's been wonderful meeting you. You remind me of a friend of mine in Richmond, Indiana named Ken Harris. Uh, Ken Harris, a wonderful Bible teacher, powerful man of God. But um, if you're writing a check, make your check to the church. You spell thousand, T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D. <laughs> you liked that, didn't you? <laughs> but uh, uh, let, let's, uh, let's give to the Lord. I know many of you are bringing your offering. You can bring your offering. We'll pray over it after you've brought your offering. Uh, they haven't even had time to get the bucket ready. But if you get your offering together, if you need an envelope, lift your hand and someone will be by to give you an envelope. But I, I do want to I do want to encourage you to be obedient uh, to the Lord. You know the Bible the Bible does tell us that uh, God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. And I found out that the only way people really give cheerfully is when they give out of obedience to the Lord. Amen. And so we want to obey God and do all that He commands us to do. <clears throat> when we're obedient to Him, He does miracles. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Anybody else need an envelope? If you need an envelope, they'll get you one. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. I tell people all the time, what we need the most is the Holy Ghost. What we need the most is the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you, my friend. I receive that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank God. Hallelujah. He says, I almost didn't make it, but you, but you made it. Amen. Thank God. You had a wonderful testimony the other night. Doctors take you off your medicine. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. All right, is everybody in here? Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank God. Get in on this offering. Listen, the, the Bible, Bible tells us if we want to, if, uh, if, we, if we sow generously, we will reap generously. If we sow sparingly, we'll reap sparingly. I'm going to tell you something. That's a, that's a true word. Uh, some people think that we, uh, that, that some televangelist wrote that scripture or something. That, that, that wasn't written by, I received that, the name of Jesus. 
That wasn't written by a televangelist. That's, that was, uh, that's the Word of God. Amen. It wasn't even, it wasn't even a man's Word. So um, uh, it was God's Word breathed, uh, breathed by God's Spirit through, uh, penned by the man of God. So I, I, want, I want you to know something. God's Word works. Don't, uh, don't, don't ever let the enemy persuade you. Because no matter what, even if you run across someone who's a charlatan or someone who's trying to rip people off who, uh, who claims to be a man of God, don't let anyone get you off the Word of God. The Bible, the Bible still says that when we give, it will be given unto us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. The Bible still tells us that we ought to be tithers and offering givers and, and, and that when we are, God opens up the windows of heaven and pours us out a blessing. There's not room enough to... Re God's Word works no matter how evil men are. God's Word works. One time, Ted, my friend, he told me he was sowing into someone's ministry that I thought was a little questionable. <laughs> and he said, I made a vow. I mean, that might be saying too much, but he said, I made a vow to this particular ministry. And, you know, a lot of times we see people and we think that we know what's in that individual's heart. Um, you know what, I'll just, I'll just tell you this, because uh, the, the ministry Ted was sown into was the ministry of Bob Tilton. And so Bob Tilton, you know, he had some questionable practices. He's gone through some things that were uh, some legal things and whatnot. And uh, so when he told me he was sewn into Bob Tilton's ministry, I was like, well, Ted. <laughs> I said, why? He said, well, he said, I felt like the Lord put it on my heart. I was like, are you sure that it, that was the Lord? You know, because why would the Lord? You know what? Uh, there was one time I was in an IHOP and the Lord told me to give this uh, waitress uh, several hundred dollars. Her name was Heaven, and she wasn't a Christian. She wasn't a Christian, but he told me to bless her with several hundred dollars. One time we were, you know, uh, God's people have a reputation for being cheap. And one time after revival, we would go into this restaurant. It's a Mexican restaurant, and uh, it was in uh, Chickasha, Oklahoma. And we'd go in there, and we'd go in there right before they closed. And nobody likes for people to go in a restaurant right before they close. But we'd go in there, and one night we went in there, and I remember the employees were giving us the evil eye. And, yeah, and, and they, they had already gone to talking about who wasn't going to stay. I'm not staying. I'm not staying. Uh, well, this one girl says, well, I'll stay. And, and she was very kind, and she sat us down at our table. I remember I went to her, I said, I said, what's the biggest tip you ever received? She said, and I can't remember what she said, maybe it was $80 or something. I said, well, we're going to do way better than that for you today. I said, today you're going to get the largest tip you ever received. I said, may, it may be the largest tip you ever receive in your whole entire life. And she was like, well, I appreciate that. You know, I don't, I don't know what she was thinking. But anyway, she, was, she served us, we got out of there, and... Um, I committed to, I committed to giving, um, I, I told everybody, I said, I'm leaving a hundred bucks. Um, if, if you all will, you know, follow suit, if you'll, uh, I'm going to sow this much. Well, Ted, he had to beat me. He had to leave 150. And then, you know, someone was like, but anyway, we left over $600 on the table for this waitress. Well, when we left, and this was before everybody was filming, you know, you know, cause, it, cause now, you know, everybody wants to get it on video and uh, we did so good. Ha <laughs> ha. But anyway, we, we just did this after service one night, about 12 of us and over $600, she came running out. I mean, her life was so, so changed. She wasn't, she wasn't a believer. And so when Ted told me that the Lord had told me to give to Bob Tilton, I was like, Ted, I'm not sure. You know, we think because we think we know everything. But I've got news for you. You don't know everything, and, ne and neither do I. L later, on, later on, I found out about Bob Tilton's ministry. There was a, a man that could, in fact, I I'll tell you because it, it'll, maybe it'll help you. Uh, anybody know who Rodney Howard Brown is? Or, all right. Brother Rodney's brother Basil, Basil Howard Brown. We were hanging out with Basil one day, and he was talking to us about um, Bob Tilton, how that when Bob Tilton would come to South Africa, he would go pick him up at the airport and he would haul him around and haul him everywhere and take him to do whatever he needed to do. He said one day he picked up Bob Tilton at the airport and he was hauling his bags with him and he was talking and he looked and Bob Tilton was nowhere to be found. So he starts looking around and he sees him and Bob Tilton has his hands laid on a woman who's deaf in the airport. Prays over her and the Lord opens her deaf ears right in the airport. 
He said, he said this, was, this was something that happened. Come Now listen, I'm not saying that because God used Bob Tilton to heal the sick that he did everything right. There's, there's people that do a bunch of stupid stuff. But you know what? Here's, here's, here's what you can know. God's word is true. See, that, that's, why, that's why you can't let the stupidity of people deter you from doing what you know God's word says. And so, so Ted, <clears throat> when I was talking to Ted about this, the Lord rebuked me. The Lord rebuked me when I was like, Ted, you're, you, know he's not, you know he's not exactly right. He, he, he's kind of shifty. He's kind of shady. Ted's like, I'm just doing what the Lord told me to do. You know what? As long as we'll do what God tells us to do, as long as we'll keep our eyes on Jesus, amen. As long as we're doing this as doing it unto the Lord, you know what? Ted wasn't really given to Bob Tilton. He was given out of obedience to the Holy Ghost. He Really what he was doing was he was giving to God. You, you know what that means? That means even when you miss it, even when you don't give, uh, uh, um, even if God didn't tell you to give or whatever and you miss it, when your heart is to give to the Lord, you've still given to God. It doesn't matter what happens with your money. If you gave it to God, that's all that's important. So I want to encourage you with that from, from now on. Father, we pray over this offering. I pray your blessing upon the gift, upon the givers of the gift. Lord, we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to participate in the economy of heaven. Lord, we know that your word is clear. And so, Lord, as your people have given, we pray that it will be given back to them. Good measure, press down, shake it together, running over, cause men to give into their bosom with the same measure that they give out, Lord, with all may it be measured unto them again. Lord, we thank you for supernaturally increase. Lord, we thank you for more than enough. We thank you, Lord. <laughs> Oh, I hear it in my spirit. You're leaving the land of barely enough. Amen. And you're moving into the land of more than enough. And as Suprama, Lord, I thank you that there is no famine. I thank you, Father, that there is no lack. I thank you, Lord, that there is no attack of the enemy. I thank you, God, that there's nothing that can happen in the economy of the United States of America that can disconnect your people from your provision and from your blessing. I thank you, God, that when, when the going gets rough, your people get going. Amen. I thank you, Father, that when, uh, when everyone else is lacking, God, they have more than enough. Lord, not just just for themselves, but Lord, they have enough to share with others and to do your work. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody that believed it shouted amen. 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 Praise God. All right, open your Bibles with me. We're going to go to the book of Judges. Some of you may have heard me talk about this before, some of you from Holland, but it'll, it'll, it'll be worth repeating. Oh, you know what? Hold on. Now, I'm not playing. Because <laughs> some people are like, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. But really, I just got to you know, thank you, Jesus. Well, you know what? Hang on a second. Praise God. We, we started something in Holland, and, and the Lord, um, one of the, th the thing that I think that God has really dealt with me the most about as a, as a believer has been walking after the Spirit, walking after the Spirit. So go to the book of Galatians. Forget about uh, Judges real quick. Go to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Today, I want to help you. Glory. 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 Today, today I want to help you. Um, if, I, if, I, if I gave you some keys that opened up the door to the supernatural, would you, you, would you use them? And, and I'm not just saying that for, for effect. If I put something in your hands that would help you to function in the realm of the spirit or function in the supernatural realm more, and not just for the purpose. When we talk about walking after the spirit and walking in the supernatural, we're not just talking about uh, being weird and, and having the warm buzzies and the numb tinglies. We're, we're talking about really following the leading of the spirit, following God to where he wants us to go. So Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some things with you that I think will help you. And... I, I really believe God's going to pour out His Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> that lady, I don't know, she's sitting next to uh, Cameron. And what's, what's that lady? You, did you drag her with you, Cameron? What's her name? What's your name? You're Cameron's mama. That girl is just the sweetest girl on this planet, man. I'm telling you. But uh, you're, you're going to get it today. Amen. Now, now I'm not trying... <laughs> I'm not trying to get you a skirt, but it is what it is. <laughs> but the Lord Jesus is going to touch you today. And 
And you, now I'm going to tell you this, you didn't come here expecting that that would happen. You, you came here and you thought, well, I'll go, you know, get her out of my hair. But God's going to touch you today. Because God, it, it wasn't really her that was pestering you. The Lord had, a, had intentions of getting you here. And before you leave here, uh, He's going to reveal Himself to you in a greater measure. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul, uh, Paul talking to the Galatians says this. He says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5.16, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the Bible commands us to walk in the Spirit. or to, uh, you, you know what you could say there? You could say, uh, walk in the Spirit, walk after the Spirit, uh, walk in the supernatural, uh, flow with the Spirit. All, it's all the same. Walk, it's walking in the Spirit. But the Bible, uh, how many of you know that the book of Galatians wasn't written to sinners? The book of Galatians was written to the church, the church in Galatia. And so when Paul told the Galatians to walk after the Spirit, he was talking to Christians. See, most Christians believe that they walk after the Spirit by default. Because they're Christians and because God's Spirit lives on the inside of them that just magically or, or whatever, they just automatically begin to walk after the Spirit. But the reality is, is that uh, after we, when, when we get born again, when a, when a person is born again, the Bible says, and it, just bear with me, I know many of you have heard me say this, but this is helpful because a lot of people forget this stuff. Or they start mixing it with other stuff that doesn't, it's, it's not really scriptural. When someone is born again, the Bible says, uh, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen. Old things pass away and all things become new. Too many people think that when they get saved, when, when, they, uh, when they walk an aisle, say a prayer, and they give their hearts to Jesus, that, that somehow, that, some, that, that what God does is, is he, uh, he just kind of starts magnifying the things that were good in their life, and He kind of minimizes the things that were bad. In other words, they're not really different other than God made them a better or, a, or an improved version of themselves. But that's not really how that works. When you got born again, the old you, the person that existed before you got saved was eradicated. Amen. God didn't take a little bit of who you were and improve on it and keep the good stuff and get rid of the bad stuff. He didn't keep anything. He got rid of it all. He got rid of it all. So the Bible says that when we're Christians, when we're born again, we, uh, we, st amen. Amen. We've been talking about growing up spiritually at my church because I found out during all this COVID stuff, Christians aren't very grown up. There aren't a lot, there's not a lot of maturity in the body of Christ today. Everybody's running around like a bunch of chickens with their heads cut off. I mean, people are, uh, I've, heard, I've heard people say the most ridiculous stuff. They, they, they pray the most ridiculous prayers. They're, they're, uh, they give their ear to listen to people that are wackier than I'll get out. That, people that, that tell people to do stuff that's unscriptural. It's ungodly. I was about to post something. Robin, we were in the parking lot uh, the other night, me, Shree, and Robin. And there were some people that were, <laughs> there were some people in a very popular, a charismatic church, a church that's very influential in charismania nowadays, uh, people that people uh, uh, send people to to learn how to flow in the supernatural, whatever. But these people were on a platform and they were about to, they're about to pray this prayer. And this prayer had to do with a vision someone had had about Gandalf and the Lord of the Rings and the Fellowship of the Rings and, and uh, this, you, you, this shall not pass and all these things. And I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Since when does God have to copy Lord of the Rings? Since when is God asking us, you know what? When you walk, when you're, when, when, when you're starting to see visions of Lord of the Rings and God telling you to do what Gandalf did, you are not walking after the Holy, you're walking after a spirit, but it is not the Holy Spirit. 
But you see, but this is something that a lot of people in, in the body of Christ, I mean, there was one person said, Brother C, you got to hear this person's testimony of going to hell. And, you know, we get, we get wowed by all these testimonies of, of where people went, people that went to hell, people that went to heaven, people that talked to angels. I mean, we, we're, we're into all these things. I had someone take a picture of me one time. They said, Brother C, look at this picture I took of you. And, and, and I took the picture and I was looking at it and they said, ooh, they said, do you see it? I said, yeah, man, I need to lose some weight. <laughs> they said, no, and then she clapping. She's like, amen, <laughs> man, brother. <laughs> I was playing with you. Anyway, so she, she looked at it. She, she says, no, brother Ziggy. She said, look, she said, the angels. And I'm, and I'm looking in there, honestly, I'm so stupid. I'm looking for, I'm looking for my children. I said, I don't see them in there. I said, my kids aren't anywhere in this picture. She said, no. She said the angels were in the meeting when we took this picture. She said, look, the orbs. And, and now, now, now I started to figure out what she was talking about. There were these, uh, um, the, the, these, these uh, little balls of light that are uh, light refractions from dust when a picture is taken. And they were calling them angels because we're, we, listen, and, I, and I, under, listen, I understand where this comes from. It comes from people's, it comes from our desire for the supernatural. For God to do what we know God can do. God is a supernatural God. When, when God does stuff, it's supernatural. Sometimes when he does stuff, it's extremely spectacular. And we, we want the supernatural. We desire for God to do supernatural things. And in our hunger and in our desire to see God do supernatural things, what some people have done is they've tried to make things supernatural that weren't supernatural. Or they've gone to doing things that we know good and well that God would. God don't even know. God don't know who Gandalf is because Gandalf isn't a real person. Gandalf's name isn't written in the Lamb's Book of Life. <laughs> he don't know how many hair, hairs Gandalf has on his head because Gandalf's hair is glued on at a studio. He's not counting. You understand? <laughs> Gandalf is not real. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I, and I, and I, I, I was good. I didn't post the video and say, what's going on? Because I thought, because here's what I thought. I thought, what we need is we need for people to declare the word of God to help people to grow up spiritually. Because people, people haven't grown. They don't, they, don't understand, they don't understand that they don't need to, they don't need to recite incantations. That they, don't need, uh, that they don't need to go through some religious rigmarole or some kind of spiritual witch, witchcraft to get God to move. But all they have to do is to understand that when you got born again, you became a new kind of creature. Amen. Your life is no longer what it was. The God kind of life came to live on the inside of you. You were born again and you became a brand new creature. Amen. And the kind of creature you became is the kind of creature that had never existed before. A man in Christ. Glory to God. A man in Christ is a man. That is a species that before Jesus came and died and rose from the dead, it was a species that had never existed before. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Glory to God. Glory. Amen. And God's spirit <laughs> came to live on the inside of man. Not a, not a clone spirit, not a... a, 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 a not the twin spirit of the Holy Ghost. The same, the same spirit that raised Jesus. Do you realize, listen, do you realize, because I, I, you, some of you can't realize this. Because we wouldn't be acting the way we're acting if we realized this. But do you realize that as Christians, the exact same spirit that went into the tomb and raised Jesus from the dead dwells on the inside of you and dwells on the inside of me. He's here. Glory to God. He's here. He's here in us. And he still has power. Amen. He 
still has power. Glory to God. <laughs> but you can tell people aren't walking after the Spirit because the Bible says when you walk after the Spirit, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, you don't give yourself over to carnality and the things that are carnal. Oh, man, you know, I mess with Titus all the time. I, I, I've, I've never, you know, Titus, <laughs> look at me, Titus, you're a good fellow. I love that little guy. But <laughs> we were at the mall today. <laughs> we were at the mall today, and I always mess with him. I, he, he'll say, hey, pastor, and, and I won't even know what he's going to say. I'll say, Titus, the Lord says no. <laughs> Just messing with him, you know. He says, well, I don't, how do you know what the Lord is saying? I said, because I know what the Lord says in the Lord. You know, just messing with him. And so he, one day he came back to me. He said, I, I said something. I said, Titus, he said, Pastor, the Lord says no. <laughs> he, got, he got back at me. But anyway, but today I had, a, I had my AirPod in and, and it fell out of my ear and hit the floor. And he says, Pastor, the Lord says, don't put that in your ear without cleaning it first. <laughs> I said, Titus, I don't believe that was the Lord that told you that. I said, there's only two other sources it could have come from. I said, do you know what those sources are? He says, yep, it was either the flesh or a bad spirit. <laughs> I thought, good, hallelujah, he's listening, you know, he's listening. <laughs> Three sources, God, the devil, or your flesh. <laughs> Amen. But a lot, a lot of times we don't understand that when we don't give ourselves over to the Holy Spirit, when we don't walk after the Spirit, we're going to give ourselves over to something. And, and I'll, I'll say this, most of the time we give ourselves over to the flesh, but sometimes we get over there and we give ourselves over to a wrong spirit or to a bad spirit, which can, which can get really nasty if we're not, if we're not careful. But here's what, here's what I want you to say. God cre when God created us, He created us to walk after the Spirit. Do you know when God created you? He created you to live in His presence. God didn't create you to function outside of His presence. That's why when we try to function outside of the presence of God, we malfunction. You know, you know what religion says? Religion says this. Religion says, you know, you know who you really are? You're that person that you are in the back, in the dark, uh, in the corner, like Flip Wilson used to say, when no one is watching. Somebody, anybody remember Flip Wilson? Uh, yeah, two of you. All right. Yeah, the devil made me. Yes, you remember Flip. <laughs> Anyway, they say, you're that person in the back in the dark. When, when, when nobody's watching, that's when the real you comes out. But you know, that's a lie. That's right. yeah. If you're a Christian, the real you comes out when you're in his presence. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you're, in, when you're in his presence, you'll begin to function the way God intended for you to function. When you get in the presence of God, amen. Amen. You know, you know, you ever seen some people, they'll get over there in the presence of God and they'll start to shout. See, that's the way they're always supposed to be. Because that's, because when you're in the presence of God, when you're in the, that's when you start to function the way God intends for you to function. You know, some people say, oh, those are special times. No, those are, those are supposed to be the, the time, those are the times where, that's the way we're supposed to live. We're supposed to, now I know that we get, uh, you know, people like, yeah, well, that'd be tiring. Well, you know, God don't get, I don't know if you know this, but God don't get tired. Do you know God's never been tired? Well, Bible says on, you know, God created the heavens here on the seventh day he rested. Yeah, but he didn't rest because he was tired. Bible says he rested because he was finished. Amen. He was finished, so he, he rested. He was finished. <laughs> Glory to God. So we've got to, we, we as God's people, we've got to learn how to walk after the Spirit. Go to the book of Romans. I'm going to show you another scripture real quick. I'm just trying to lay a foundation here. Romans chapter 8. Glory to God. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Look what it says. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God... They are the sons of God. Amen. So if you're led by the Spirit of God, then you're a son of God. So if God, if you are a son or a daughter of God, and how do you be a son or daughter, become a son or a daughter of God? Well, Jesus said this. He said, he says that uh, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe upon his name. So those of us who are born again, those of us who have believed on him, we're the sons and we're the daughters of God. Amen. 
And the Bible says that we as sons and daughters of God can be led by the Spirit of God. Now, why do we want to be led by the Spirit? Because the Spirit's never going to lead you to stupid. I, I, had a lady, I had a lady one time come up and tell me, she said, uh, she said, Brother Ziggy, will you pray for me? I said, what do you want me to pray for? She said, well, the Lord told me to divorce my husband. And when she said that, I, I, I just paused for a second, you know, and she went through a whole story. And I said, now, I said, I love you. And you know I do. They was in this long revival. I said, I love you. You know I love you. And if I tell you something, would you at least be open to hearing what I have to say? She said, yes. I said, the Lord didn't tell you to divorce your husband. I said, because uh, the Bible tells us that God is anti-divorce. Right. God will never ask you to do something that goes. I, now listen, some, I know some of you right now, you're coming to a place of discovery. You're discovering that you did something stupid. But that's okay. Those are good discoveries to make. No one's condemning you. No, I wasn't condemning her for divorce. I, wasn't con I said, you know, here's the thing. You may have had a good reason to divorce your husband. Because I'm a man. I'm not God. If, if a woman is in a relationship and she's being beaten by a man, I, if, if they, I don't know about you, Pastor, but if I have someone come counsel with me and, they're, and it's a woman being beaten by her husband, I do not recommend that those people live in the same roof, under the same roof in the same house. I, I, I tell that woman, you need to get out of there. Now, I'm not saying that you'll never go back, but you need to get out of there before you get hurt. Get out. Well, you know, and then I'll, and I've had husbands come and say, what kind of preacher are you encouraging my wife to leave me? I said, I'm the kind of preacher that knows you're an idiot for beating your wife. Right, yeah. right, right. I'm like, don't even roll up on me like you're going right. to beat on me. I'm telling right. you right now, I'll whoop you in the name of, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. Now I'll say, no, I, but I stay in the spirit. I have to get back. I'll pull it back. I didn't, I'll pull it back. I'll pull it back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll <pull it> back. <laughs> I'm about to minister to you in a fivefold ministry, you understand? But anyway, but but I'm you know I I don't believe that uh, that that people ought to stay in that in that place. Sometimes you know, have you ever made a mistake? Anybody? Anybody ever made a bad decision? You bought the wrong car. You you bought the wrong house. You you did something stupid. You know, some people actually marry the wrong people. They make a mistake. And divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Unfortunately, in some denominations, they will, they will, it is. They will not license you. They will not let you serve in any capacity of ministry. If you, now, you can murder your wife, and they'll license you. But you can't divorce your wife, which boggles my mind. But anyway, but... A divorce is a forgivable sin. And so I told her, I said, I don't know what the circumstances were of your divorce. There's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not telling you go back and reconcile with your husband. But don't tell people that God told you that because that's a lie. It's a lie. You, you've, got to, you've got to live according to the word of God. You've got to walk after the spirit. Amen. Amen. If, if you walk after the Spirit, the Holy Ghost isn't going to lead you to do something against God's Word. See, this is, this is why God's people have to walk after the Spirit. Because when we walk after the Spirit, God's Spirit's not going to lead you to do something that's anti-God. Amen. In fact, if you're sick, I reckon if you follow after the Holy Ghost, He'll lead you out of sickness and into health. If you're poor, I believe if you'll follow the Holy Ghost, He'll lead you out of poverty and into wealth. Now, there are some people that, I, like, I, there's a guy who's going back and forth with one of my members on Facebook, and, and man, I'm so glad that I've, <laughs> that most of the time I resist the temptation of getting on there. But anyway, he's, he's going back and forth, and there's this fellow that posted a picture of some, uh, um, Oh, it was a Ferrari or something. And a picture of Joel Osteen next to it. And Joel Osteen has a Ferrari or something like that. Anyway, Joel Osteen, I don't know if he has a Ferrari. I don't know if he has four of them, but that's... <laughs> who gives a rip? <laughs> I don't care. Absolutely. I don't care. That's like people pestering me about things that I have, you know. But 
And so th th this fellow says, uh, these, you know, we've got to get rid of these uh, crazy, you know, uh, carnal preachers that all they think about is money. And, you know, and a lot of people don't even bother to, bother to think about the fact that Joel Osteen doesn't just pastor a church. He writes books. He, uh, he, he, he speaks for, uh, uh, he speaks outside of the church for different groups, different organizations that pay him for doing that, an honorarium. This dude makes money a lot of different, you know, he's not like us that we get our money from, you know, working at Chick-fil-A. One, one revenue stream. That's, that's, but see, that's all most of us know. And that's why many people never break out financially because we don't, we don't know nothing about how to make money. We, we, we just condemn people that have a lot of it, especially if they're believers. And if they're preachers, we, we condemn them doubly. Because they bought a Ferrari on the $3.50 we sent them in, a, in, an, in an envelope one time. Can you imagine people getting mad? Uh, Creflo Dollar, when he, bought, when he said, we need $65 million for an airplane. I mean, you, you'd, have thought the whole, you'd have thought the whole world opened up, man. And the, the, I mean, people were appalled. I had friends that were preachers down there. I'm appalled. How dare he say that he needs $65 million? Nobody needs $65 million. I'm like, my God, you live in a hole in the wall. You can barely pay your car payment. You, you can barely pay your bills. You can barely pay your lights. Um, I saw you start a GoFundMe here on Facebook for your little ministry last week, and now you're going to condemn Creflo because he says he needs $65 million. For a, how in the world would you know? Number one, who are you to try to tell a man that budgets millions and millions of dollars every year how to, how to budget ministry money when you can't even budget 30000 So now all of a sudden you're an expert on how to run a multi-million dollar ministry. Yep, listen, if you can't say amen, say ouch. Amen. amen. <laughs> if you can't say amen, say ouch. A lot of people, they don't understand. Like aircraft, I understand purchasing an aircraft. And, and I, I may have told, but I, I tell people, I'm like, you don't even know. You don't even know what you're talking about. Because Creflo, Creflo, when he bought that airplane, he, bought, he was buying one of only three in existence. All right? So when he, when he buys it, then whoever bought the last one, the company finally delivers that airplane to them. Because Creflo, when he, when he decided to buy that airplane, he flew in one of those airplanes uh, to demonstrate it. He flew in one, and that airplane was flown by the company. I can't remember the company that he was, uh, I can't remember the company he was buying for Gulfstream. Gulfstream uh, had, had that airplane, but that airplane didn't belong to them. They, they built that airplane for someone else. Gulfstream was leasing that airplane from whoever they bought it from to give demonstrations so they could sell another airplane. So when you buy an airplane, especially an airplane of that caliber, uh, Gulfstream, like if I was to go buy Gulfstream like Creflo, I'd go buy it. For, we'd agree, 60, let's say 65 million, 65 million. Gulfstream would then say, we would like to lease that back from you for so many hours or for so many months, and we will give you $15 million to, to lease your airplane from you. Well, you know what? That's how that's done. So Creflo didn't pay $65 million. Uh, he, he paid $65 million uh, to acquire it, but immediately he made $15 million to lease it back to Gulfstream. On top of that, every, he, he got to take the $65 million that he purchased the airplane for, and he got to write every bit of that off in depreciation in the first three years of ownership. So he got to write every $65 million off of his taxes which I'm sure was a big time blessing to his ministry. Amen. Well, y'all don't pay taxes. See, you don't know nothing. Absolutely. Come on. You have no idea. Well, praise God. See now, see, why aren't you getting excited about that? Amen. Glory to God. Thank God. Cref Creflo saved money for the kingdom. No, you know, we was belly. We... <laughs> We're sitting in, our, we're driving down the road in our car that smokes like a mosquito truck complaining about Creflo. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So Creflo takes possession of his airplane. He writes off in depreciation, $65 million. Now, when he's not using his airplane, you know what he does? He leases, he leases or rents out his airplane to, to uh, people like um, uh, 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 J-Lo and Jay-Z and Beyonce and, and, and all these people that would love to own an airplane like that, but they don't. So they just rent them from people that do. And so the wealth of the wicked now all of a sudden is laid up for the righteous. <laughs> and Creflo is flying around doing the work of the ministry you in, using Jay-Z's money and using Beyonce's money and using, amen. Amen. <laughs> See, amen. I heard Jesse Duplantis talk about how he had this house, he had this house, he had this. And, and people were like, he don't need all them houses. No, he doesn't. What's he going to do with all them houses? See, we don't have enough sense to think it through. He lives in them one at a time. And then when he's not in them, he rents them out. Well, who rents out a, a, a luxurious house like that? Well, not you. You're at the Super 8, you know what I'm saying? Come out smelling like curry. I'm, I'm not being negative. You know, a lot of Indian folks own those hotels. You get in there, your clothes smell like, <laughs> that's like curry and everything. We stay, at the, we stay at the Super 8. When we go on vacation, we go and we rent places from, from people that are lost. And then we complain when God's people get in that niche and begin to understand how to, how, to, how to tap into revenue stream. See, the Holy Ghost, when you follow the leading of the Spirit, He'll, He'll lead you to places where you tap into that flow of increase. But see, we, don't, we will never know them as long as we have a poverty mentality, as long as we continue to think on the level that we're capable of thinking. I'm going to tell you what, I grew up in poverty, and poverty doesn't teach you how to get wealthy. All, pover all the poverty mentality teaches you how to do is stay poor. Amen. But when God begins to break you out, listen, I'm going to tell you straight up, God will begin to lead you in ways that you never dreamed or imagined. I, rem I remember the first time the Lord taught me a lesson was when I was purchasing an airplane. I was going to buy it cash. Bless God, we're not going to we're not going to uh, uh, we're not going to get into debt on this airplane, not one bit. And we had raised all the uh, all the cash that we needed to buy this first airplane, and and we're not going to we're not going to pay. Uh, we're not going to be in debt. And so I went and I talked to this fellow about this airplane. He says, it's "Wonderful." And I told him, I'm just, I'm just waiting. I just, we have, a, we lack a little bit before we have enough money to purchase the airplane. He said, I, he said, I'm, 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 I'm not trying to teach you anything. I'm not trying. He said, you could do whatever you want to do. He said, but can I ask you a question? He said, why in the world would you want to dump all your money into a depreciating asset? I said, well, talk to me a little more. He said, he said, Zig, he says, I, he says, I have, I sell airplanes to millionaires, to billionaires. He said, none of them are stupid enough to put all their money into a depreciating asset. He said, why don't you borrow the money? It's cheap. Take the money that you've got, put it somewhere else and make money with it and let it pay for the airplane. He says, but dear God, don't pay all you, don't put all the money in that airplane. He says, you don't know what the market's going to do. Uh, you know, now, I mean, we're in a, we were in a recession then, and this fellow that was selling me the airplane, he paid $780,000 for that airplane. I didn't pay near that much for that airplane. It had depreciated greatly because of the economy. Some guy that put $780,000 in that airplane when it was brand new, uh, sold it to me four, four or five years later, just four or five years later. They, airplanes usually don't depreciate that much. If you buy an $800,000 airplane five years ago, you're going to pay $700,000 for it now. But, but then during the recession, that, that airplane had depreciated nearly, well, a little more than half. So I bought it. I bought it, and you know what? I had all that money, and I didn't stick all that money in it. I used that money for other stuff. He was right. 
He was right. But you know what? You, we got to learn. When we follow the Holy Ghost, He'll teach us things. He'll show us these things. He'll lead us in ways that are more wise. Boy, I'm helping somebody. I know I'm not helping everybody because some of you, you, you live hand to mouth and you're going to do that your whole life because that's all you know. But that's not God's plan. If you'll walk after the Spirit, God will show you how to live higher. Amen. Amen. So, praise God. Now, let me say this. Ooh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause see, now, see, I got, I got over there, start talking about finance for a minute. Now, see, some people are like, well, why is that? You're talking about walking after the spirit, and then you're bringing money into it. Listen. For everything, that, for everything that exists in the spirit, there's something in the natural that mirrors it. For example, we have Holy Ghost fire. Well, in the natural, we have, you know, fire. We, we see it. Um, H2O in the natural. In the spirit, we have living water. Yeah. Living water. Yeah. So, um, in the natural, people say this, money is power. And if you don't believe that, you had not been watching the news lately. <laughs> And, and, but, you know, I'm, I'm encouraging people to do less and less of that. But anyway, people that have money typically get away with more than people that don't have money in the legal system. Because money, that fella Epstein, the, the pedophile, I mean, that dude, his money bought him a lot of time to do a lot of evil. Now, someone who was impoverished, they wouldn't have got away with that for 10 days. They wouldn't have got away with that for 10 days. But this fellow, he had money. He had money to buy police officers, judges, uh, politicians. In fact, many of those people participated in his antics with him. And that still hadn't all come out. And you know what? It may never come out because of money. Because money is power. So in the natural, money is power. Well, what is power in the spirit? The anointing. The anointing. The anointing. Now, let me ask you this question. If God can't trust you with natural power, what in the world makes you think he's going to trust you with spiritual power? See, that's why these things are important. Because however we treat these things that he's given us that we can touch and feel, that, that we say are real, however we do with that, depends on how God's going to trust us with the true riches. Amen. Amen. So if you can't handle power in the natural, God's not going to entrust you with supernatural power. No. God's not going to entrust you with supernatural power. Now, I know some of you say, well, there was some out there, you know, charlatans, and I, I don't have time to explain all that. But anyway, so turn to someone, tell them, walk after the Spirit. Turn to someone else, tell them, walk after the Spirit. All right, now go to the book of Hebrews. We're going to shift gears here for a moment. And I'm, I'm going to pray for you. Hebrews chapter 11. Hmm. Now, the walk of the Spirit is a walk of faith. Amen. It's a faith walk. Because the Holy... The, here's the trouble. If the Holy Spirit was visible to the eye, it'd be easy to... Because really walking after... But let me explain what walking after the Spirit is. Walking after the Spirit. Um, and and I'll, I'll help you to, how many of you want to know whether you, do, whether you walk after the Spirit or not? I can, I can help you determine that. I'm going to help you. Um, walking after the Spirit. If you're going to walk after the Spirit, you have to do it intentionally. It's not going to happen on accident. Come on. Um, you will, uh, we automatically are carnal. One time my friend Teddy said, I'm going to do a study on the flesh. I was like, you don't have to. I said, you were born with a doctorate in, you were born with a doctorate in carnality. I mean, you, you're, you're going to be carnal and fleshly automatically. If you do nothing with your life, you're going to be carnal. If you're going to walk after the Spirit, then you have to do it intentionally. You have to make a decision that I'm going to do what it takes to walk after the Spirit. You say, well, what is that? Well, whatever, whatever it is, you have to be intentional about it, whether it's pray, whether it's read the Word. It has to be intentional. So you can, you can determine whether or not you walk after the Spirit simply by this. If you don't wake up every day putting forth effort to walk after the Spirit, then you're in the flesh. I mean, it's that simple. 
If you're not putting forth, if you're not, if you're not using any, any energy or you're not putting forth any effort every day to walk after the Spirit, then you're carnal. Because it doesn't automatically happen. You have to do it intentionally. Amen. You, listen, you'll never be all that you see, that all that you have seen in visions and dreams until you get intentional about what you're doing. See, if we're going to be victorious, if you're going to be victorious, you have to be victorious intentionally. If you're going to have, if you're going to be anointed, you're not going to be anointed on accident. You have to be, you're, you're going to have to do that. You're going to have to submit yourself or, or, or align yourself with the anointing of God for your, intentionally. When, when we, when we're, uh, when we watch sports, and I know some of you do, I mean, B Bowling Green University over here, uh, I, I'm sure they have a team. I reckon I've seen them every now and again. They may not be great, are they? I don't know. You, you, okay, well, I mean, because I don't see a bunch of, like in Oklahoma City, or in uh, Norman, Oklahoma, at o, where OU is. I mean, you go over there, and them people are nuts. Over in Columbus, uh, uh, o o Ohio State. Yeah. Yeah. I, amen, yeah, amen. listen. I have never, yeah, 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 shh, shh. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, he's somewhere else. He's like, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, 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 wrong conference. But oh, I would say, when we lived in Columbus, the Columbus area, um, you know, the university was in Ath Athens, right? Is that where it is, Athens? But you know, the entire city of Columbus would shut down on Saturday. It was crazy. It became a ghost town. When we lived there for two years, we couldn't figure out why at certain times on Saturdays, no one was around. We finally asked someone. We we're like, man, it's like a ghost town. They said, Ohio State's playing. You know, I, I, they were, I mean, they were, so, you know, Ohio State's had great teams over the years. Let me ask you a question. When you, when you get the, when they go and they interview players and they interview coaches, when they interview, you ever heard a coach interviewed and they say, so coach, um, What'd you do this year to win the championship? You ever hear him say this? I'm not sure. It just happened, you know. It must have been our time. Been a long time. You know, we had one coming, I guess. You ever hear him say that? No. You know why? Because that's not how you win championships. If you're going to win a championship, you have to do it intentionally. You, you, can't, you can't be like, well, fellas... This could be our year. You know what I'm saying? This could be our year. It's been a long time since we've, again, we got to win one. I mean, we got to have one coming. No, that's not how it works. They're like, look, this is what we did wrong last year. We, we had a rebuilding year last year. It was difficult last year. But you know what? This year we've got some new players and we've learned some things and we've studied some things. And so if they win the championship, next time someone wins a championship, listen to the coaches, listen to the players. They're going to tell you exactly what not. They're not going to be like, well, I'm not sure. Ask George. No, they're going to be. The, you, they, they ask the quarterback. He'll say, well, I got with the offensive coach and we worked on this and we watched some films and we watched what I was doing last year and I got stronger after I was injured I went through some physical therapy and I developed this and I developed that and as a result of us develop, developing this we ended up winning the championship the coach well we lost some of our better players but we had some good ones come in we had some good recruiters we had some guys training these guys we have a bunch of young guys that are hungry we've got a hungry team and so we begin to pour into them they let us coach them and we brought out the best in them They'll tell you exactly how they did it. Yeah. It's only in church where we come and we're like, ah, I hope it happens today. <sighs> we're due for a move of God. <laughs> Hello! You know what? Very few people come in here like you came in here tonight, Jerry, saying, bless God, hallelujah, I came here to get something. I don't know about anybody else. I mean, you may want to sit around on your bumper around here and wait to get a touch from God, but bless God, I'm pulling on heaven today. Amen. Glory to God. Listen, that's how you get in the spirit. You don't wait to feel like you're getting in the spirit. You make a decision that God said that you could walk after the spirit. And if he said you could do it, then bless God, you get over there and you do whatever it takes to get in the Holy Ghost.
Some people say, well, it don't take all that. How do you know what it takes? All I know is that throughout history, there were people that when they got in the Holy Ghost, they acted just like you acted. They did just like you did. I mean, how desperate are you? I don't, know about, I don't know about you all, but the, the time for us being um, passive, right. it's got, we've, we've, got to, we've got to stop being passive. Being passive has gotten us to where we're at right now. We got a bunch of lazy people coming to church, and, some, and most preachers have got them believing that if they'll just keep sitting there like they're sitting there long enough that someday, somewhere down the road, sometime soon, something's going to happen. Well, yeah, something's going to happen. Those people are going to grow a brain, and they're going to leave your place, and they're going to go someplace where they can get in the flow of the Holy Ghost. Listen, I'm going to tell you something, church. I'm, 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 I'm through playing patty cake with people. I'm, I'm through pacifying people. I'm, I'm through with, with, uh, with condoning what people, uh, what leaders in the body of Christ have done to the church up to this point in time. Enough is enough. Listen, some of you are dying where you're at. It's time for you to find someone else to run with, someone that's running toward the things of God, not someone who is sitting passively waiting to see what's going to happen. You need someone who's going to stretch out that staff that God put in their hand and part a Red Sea. You need someone who's going to stand in front of a tomb and say, roll the stone away. You need someone who's going to look at people and say, look, I know you're crippled, but stretch out your hand. Because if you ever follow the... <laughs> Who was, who, was the, who was the prime example for being led by the Spirit? Jesus. Yes, sir. Yep. Jesus, right? Yes. And, what, and, what is, and what does the Bible record about Jesus? The Bible says this, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. You know what? Many of you that are sitting here, I feel it in my spirit. I, can, I sense it in my spirit. There are many of you that are here in this place that at some time or another, your life has been touched by individuals that didn't live for God passively but lived for God radically. Your, your, your father was one of those people that lived a radical Christian life. And I thank God that I, that I met him and had the opportunity and the privilege of hanging out with him, even though I didn't get to hang out with him for a long time because there's a big age gap. And he thought I was nuts anyhow, but not, not, that it, not in a bad way. He thought I was so nuts, he wanted me to come give my testimony at his church. You understand? He's like, I want this kid to come to my church. I know he's an idiot, but he'll do good. <laughs> Amen. And some of you, the person, that, the person that you've rubbed shoulders with or that you've come in contact with recently that has that radical spirit is me. And you know what? You tell people, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not tooting my own horn here, because I'm going to tell you right now, uh, it, it's not really my nature to be this way. This is not my nature. This is not how I naturally am. I am naturally a, an introvert. But when God touched me, when the Holy Ghost came into my life, when I underwent a transformation, when God called me to ministry, God began to deal with me and He said, you can't be that way to do what I've called you to do. You can't sit at home. You can't be quiet. You can't just be selective at who you're going to have fellowship with. You've got to get in there and you've got to begin to speak my word. You've got to begin to encourage people. You've got to begin to call people to arms. You've got to begin to equip people. That same spirit that you have, that same anointing to do the work that Jesus did. You've got to activate it in my people. 
And again, I'm, I'm not tooting my own horn here. If, if, if you've ever had anyone that has, that has, uh, that you've brushed alongside of them, that you've been a part of something that God was doing in them, you know that there's something more. You know that there's something greater. Everything on, especially now, especially now when there's been a line drawn and there are those that stand on the side of the line that say, be safe. And then there's the other side that says, we can take this land. There's one side that looks and they said, there's giants out there. They're, they'll, they'll kill us. We're like little tiny bugs to them. And then you've got these others that are saying, this is our land, bless God. This is our land. God said we could take it. God said we could have it. We can take them. If we'll rise up, we can take them. You know, the devil's gotten away with a lot in this country. He's gotten away with a lot uh, attacking the church, trying to strip us of our rights, trying to get the word of God out of schools, trying to get prayer away from our children, trying to abort and to murder and to kill preachers before they come out of their mamas. But I'm telling you right now, the Holy Ghost is rising up on the inside of God's people. And much of what has happened up to this point in time is about to come to a screech halt because God's people are going to rise in the power of his spirit and they're going to take back what the devil has stolen. It's time. But you have to be intentional. Turn to someone, tell them, be intentional. Be intentional. You got to do it on purpose. If you're going to get in the Holy Ghost, you're going to have to do it on purpose. How, how, do you, how do you get in the Holy Ghost? Well, you obey Him. Well, I'm not sure I know how to do that. Well, you know what? When you find something in the Word and it inspires you, do it. You know, you know what I, I encourage people to do that's easy? It's very easy to worship God the way God wants you to worship God. We've, we've told people, for, man, there have been people told people for you, preachers, worship the Lord the way you want to, amen. God don't want you worshiping Him the way you want to. The way we want to worship sucks. Come on. Come on. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm not being ugly. It's the truth. The way we worship pacifies and satisfies us. It leans more toward my bursitis, my arthritis, my bronchitis, all my itises, you know. That's the direction your worship and your praise leans. But, but when you do it the way God says, you know, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Praise Him on the cymbals. Praise Him on the high-sounding cymbal. Praise Him on the, on the harp. Praise Him with the stringed instruments. Praise Him with the dance. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continue. See, when you, when you begin to do that, when I walked in here tonight, that's what, was, that's what I heard in here. And listen, some of you participated, and you participated because you didn't want to look like you weren't participating. <laughs> but you know what? That's okay. That's okay. Because eventually what happens is you begin to see the value of what it is that you're doing. Eventually you begin to understand that there's power in what you're doing. That the Bible told us to do these things because they align us with the realm of the Spirit. They align us with the Holy Ghost. They align us with the Spirit of God. They align us so that we can, so that we can function the way God intends for us to function. Pretty soon uh, the bursitis, the, all the itis start to fall off of us. And, and we don't know when. One of the things that I dealt with uh, in, in the early years of my salvation, in fact, I, I'm trying to figure out how long it was, is all the way up into the 90s, into the mid-90s, I had a terrible temper. I got saved in 1983, 
And I had a terrible time. And when I say that, I'm not, I wasn't a, I didn't beat my wife or anything like that. I wasn't violent toward my wife or uh, anything. But if, if I got mad, I had to do something. I throw a, one time I got mad, I threw a cup of red Kool-Aid. And I didn't throw it across the room. I just threw it into the sink. I was angry. Of course, then red Kool-Aid got over, all over. My wife said, I'm not cleaning that up. You made the mess, you clean it up. And then you have regrets, you know, you're like, why did I do that, you know? I bought a car, got mad at it one time and hit it with my fist, put a big old dent in it. I mean, I'm only destroying my stuff, you know? But man, someone cut me off in the road. On my way to church, if someone cut me off in traffic, did some, man, I would, I'd get mad. I'd speed up, follow a road rager big time, pull in front of him, get out of my car. How dare you? I wouldn't, I wouldn't cuss or anything. It wasn't like I backslid in that way, but I was, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't doing what Jesus would have done. I mean, I'd pound on the window, you idiot, what's wrong with you? Where'd you get your license out of a Cracker Jack box? Well, you know, people get out of their cars and I'm like, yeah. Then I get back in my car on my way to church and think, oh God, please don't let them be going to the same church I'm going. Because you, you, you feel like an idiot, you know? And I didn't know. For a long time, I was like, how do I? I would cry over it, man. I would, I would get in my prayer closet and pray about it. And, oh, God, I want to be delivered from this. I want to be. And, and I, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, how do, I, how do I get delivered? He says, quit praying about it. I was like, what? Quit praying about it. I was like, what do you want me to do? He says, I want you to live. Live for me. He said, keep living for me. He says, every time you fall, he says, the enemy accomplishes what he wants to accomplish. You spend four or five days doing nothing but magnifying your sin. Magnifying your difficulty. He said, quit magnifying your difficulty and start magnifying me. So you know what I started doing? Every time, every time I did something stupid, if I got mad, if I pounded on someone's window, I'd get in the car, I'd crank on the praise, I'd lift up my hands and begin to thank God. Lord, I thank you, I've been delivered, hallelujah. Lord, I thank you that I, <laughs> I thank you that I have the mind of Christ. <laughs> that's, that's where the Spirit, the Spirit will lead you over there to praise. Do you know, as, as I got my eyes on the Holy Ghost in those kinds of situations, eventually, in the, somewhere in the mid-90s, I, don't, I can't even tell you when, honestly, this is the honest truth, I can't even tell you when this happened, but somewhere in the early to mid-90s, it just went away. And I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know where, but now, and I'll, I'll be honest, it's not that I never get angry at all. I mean, I get angry, but I'm going to tell you, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I don't, but I'm not, uh, if, if I'm going to, like my son, my kids, I had kids after the Lord delivered me from me. I had kids. <laughs> and sometimes it's very difficult to get them to do what you want them to do unless they think you're unhappy with them. And I love them so much. <laughs> I was 32 when we had my first, you know, my first, my daughter, 32 years old. We wait a long time. She's so wonderful. She's so sweet. She's so beautiful. I, I love that girl. <laughs> She's getting married. She's having to go on her own, do some things on her own. I'm, I'm paying for a car. I'm paying for all these things. Do you know how many times this week I've almost texted her and said, baby, just keep the car. I'm going to pay for your car. I'm going to do, you know, but I'm like, I have to let her grow up. You know what I'm saying? And so I have to take the text back, but I love them so much. But anyway, my son, my son did crazy stuff. He was, he was, he is honoring. And he would do stuff and I'd be like, you know, I was real cool with both of them. Now, Michael, my daughter, her name is Michael. We, I, she responded real well to conversation. We would talk and she would talk back with me and I could see her little mind working. And she was real good about, under, she'd get mad sometimes at me, but I'd say, what, what's going on? She's like, dude, you're making me mad. I'm, I'm like, well, go ahead. It's okay. You'll be okay. And then I see her settle down. She's like, but I understand. 
You know, she was real cool. My son, <laughs> you're a terrible dad. <laughs> if I had any other dad, I'll take any other dad but you. All my friends' dads are better than you. None of them are like you. I don't know why you're that way. You're tormenting me all the time. Ah! <laughs> One, one morning I tell him, brush your teeth. No. He's the only one ever. He's the only person to, to ever tell me no like that. I mean, just blatant. No. Go brush your teeth. No. I'm just sitting there, you know, I'm like, Gabriel, just go, just listen to me. You're going to brush your teeth this morning. Either you're going to do it or I'm going to do it. I said, if you do it, you'll have a few left. If I do it, you're not going to have but a tooth. To Your brush will certainly be a toothbrush tomorrow because you'll only have one to brush. <laughs> like, go brush your teeth while you still have some. <laughs> no! Well, I stood up. When I stood up, he <laughs> drops everything he's doing. Things go flying and he runs off to the bathroom, you know. So I sit back down. Now, mind you, I've never even hit this boy. Just the threat. <laughs> Sometimes the look. Now, this where the <laughs> this where I had to start to get tougher. So anyway, th this is a funny story. I mean, I hope you'll. Oh man, I need to hurry. So yeah, amen. So it's Friday too, right? It's party time. So. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Got three people ready to party. <laughs> amen. <laughs> so I take. <laughs> He's, he's in the bathroom, and um, I'm having to get him to school. And my, daughter's, my daughter is freaking out because she knows that he's, like, pushing the limits. She never pushed the limits that far. And, and she's always stressed out, so I can see her little eyes are wide, you know. She's like, something's getting ready to happen in this house. <laughs> She, her, she got big hair, you know. She just, you know, something's getting, you know. And and I look, and Gabriel, he's he's supposed to be brushing his teeth, but he's I, I can see him in the mirror. He's in his bathroom. He's looking in the mirror at me in the living room. <laughs> defiant. I was like, boy, you hadn't even been to defiance, and you're defiant. There he is, and, and I'm like, boy, I told you to brush your teeth. And, and he's just standing there. So I got up, and when I went to walk over there, man, he's, he's, he's opening up drawers and looking for toothpaste. He, he grabbed a hairbrush and started putting a toothpaste on it. You know, you know, he's just trying to hurry up before I get there. I was like, no, it's too late. And I grabbed him by the arm. And my daughter's behind me. She's like, dad, um, dad, dad, uh, it's okay, dad. It'll be all right. <laughs> you know, because, because, and, and here's the thing. I, I'm, not, I'm not angry, but I had to, this is the first time I had to put on to make like I was angry in hopes that he would understand. And, but it, it didn't work out well because I get him in the room in my daughter's room, and I get him, I get, I sit down on the bed, and I get him bent over my knee. He's like, Dad, Dad, and my daughter's like, oh, Dad, please, Dad, please, you know, be reasonable. Dad. I'm, but this is my daughter, and she's, and she's young, too. She's like, be reasonable, Dad, just take a minute, take a, take a, count to ten, you know, take a breath, count to ten. <laughs> <laughs> She's telling me all these things. And I'm like, boy, I've had it with you. And I get it. You know, and you know how they are. There's all. Uh, and so he, he doesn't know. We, you know, dad's uh, parents, we got ninja moves. You know, we can, we can get them all tangled up. And so I got it. all his moves. All he accomplished is putting his butt right in the right place. His old butt was sticking out. I was like, there, that's it, right there. <laughs> And I went like this, and my daughter, my daughter my, who has never been spanked, is like this. <laughs> and before I can spank him, he looks back at me, he says, don't go crazy on me, Dad. <laughs> well, I did just what you're doing. I started laughing. I was like, boy, the Lord Jesus saved you today. I said, go brush your teeth, boy. <laughs> He laughed all the way to the toilet. It didn't help my, my uh, it didn't help with, with me making him believe that I could get angry. 
every time after that, I'd say, boy, you know what? He'd just, he'd just smile at me. He's like, you do that pretty good, Dad. I'm like, boy, give me a break. Just go get it done. You know, and he got good after that, but amen. But the Lord delivered. I don't know when it happened, but it did. You know, God will do, the Holy Ghost will lead you out of trouble. He'll lead you to the place where you entertain uh, God's ministry and God's gift for your life. You know, I know many of you, you came today and you came with an expectation that God would uh, pour out His Spirit on you. Can I, can I share this? I know I'm, I'm going to go a little over time, but if your butt's falling asleep, uh, turn the other cheek. And we'll, I'm just going to read this to you. And, and so to walk after, it's a, it's a faith thing. you got to do it. The Holy Ghost is invisible. And so walking after the Spirit. Walking after the Spirit is not, is not just walking in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. To walk after the Spirit means that you follow the lead of the Spirit. In other words, if you could see a picture of it, if I walked around here and you followed me, you'd be following after Ziggy. It's the same thing. When we follow after the Holy Ghost, we, we go where He leads us. We, we do what He tells us to do. And I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes He'll tell you to do some odd things. But they'll always result in God's, God's uh, like this lady here. She don't know it, but the, the Holy Spirit really brought her here today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Take this string off of here. Put it up on the so anyway, Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to try to make this uh, point super quick. Um, we, we, we know this, the faith. They, some people call this the faith chapter. I think it is. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report through faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so the things which are seen were made with, the, uh, with things which do, uh, were not made with things which do appear. In other words, gone. The, uh, this, this earth didn't come from a bunch of dust Amen. molecules in the atmosphere. This earth came out of God. When, when God, you know, the earth, when God said, before the earth ever was, it was in God. And, and he saw it, and then when he said it, it came out of God and it became. What's so awesome about that is that God's word is so powerful that when he, when he spoke the earth into existence, you ever hang a Christmas ornament? You ever have them Christmas ornaments that you hang fall off before even Christmas comes? Yeah. See, God hung the earth on His Word. And God's Word is so strong that whenever that happened, whether it was thousands of years ago or whether it was millions of years ago, His Word is so powerful that the earth is still hanging on His Word right now. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's still hanging out here on His Word. Science can say whatever they want to say. The earth is hanging on the Word of God. Yeah. Global warming, global warming. No, listen, you've got something to worry about that's more than global warming. It's global melting. I'm telling you, it's coming. It's coming. One day, he's gonna, it's fire is going to hit this place. But as, as long as we have his word, everything's going to hang where it needs to be, doing what it needs to do on the word of God. So we understand that that happened through faith. Say through faith. So when we walk after the Spirit, it's not something that we do by feelings. You don't shout because you feel it. You shout because you know it. Yes, now, now you may end up feeling something when you get to shouting, but that's not. We, don't wait for what you feel. Act on what you know. What you know God says. What you know His Word says. What you know He's given us by His Spirit. So anyway, um, it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. By faith Enoch. A people call this the hall of faith. By faith this one. By faith that one. Verse 6 is what I want us to look at. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. First thing I want to tell you is this. Some people say the opposite of faith is fear, but the opposite of faith really isn't fear. The opposite of faith is sight. For we walk by faith and not by... So the opposite of faith is sight. Operating and moving by what you see in the natural and not by what you know in, uh, according to the Word of God and by the Spirit. So here's what it says. Some people have said this. They've, they've taken this scripture to mean this. But without faith it's impossible to please Him. They've said this. So the Bible tells us that faith pleases God. That's not really what this verse says. Read it. 
but without faith it's impossible to please him. Let's say the opposite of that. So then with faith it becomes possible to please him. So in other words, just faith isn't what pleases him. Faith only makes it possible for us to please him. It's not an assurance. It's not, it's not a certain thing. So uh, there are two kinds of faith. There's living faith and there's dead faith. The Bible, the Bible talks about two kinds of faith. Now, you know, I'm, I'm going to skim over this super, super quick, and we're not going to get into it, and I'm not going to make a good case for, for this if you don't believe this. But anyway, uh, the Bible tells us in the book of James that faith without works is what? Dead. Is dead. So it's possible to have faith, but it be a dead faith. And uh, again, James talks about it. It says, uh, be hearers of the word and not doers, or be doers of the word and not hearers only. Did, <laughs> but I had that messed up. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Amen. So what happens when we hear the word and we don't do the word? When we don't do the word, we're not really operating in living faith. But if we hear the word and we know the word and we don't do anything with it, then faith without works is dead. So we have a dead faith, which is why we're deceived. Because we have the word, we believe the word, we're just not doing anything with it, which is most of the church today. We have faith, it's just dead faith. It doesn't become living until we put it to work. So when the, when the word says, when the word tells us here that without faith it's impossible to please him, so then when we have faith, it becomes possible. But the only way that that faith pleases God is when that faith accomplishes that which God intended for that faith to do. It becomes living faith when we become doers of the word. Amen. When we do the word of God, when we do the word of God by faith. So, um, so then, uh, uh, the next part of the verse is, uh, <laughs> next part of the verse is part of what I want, to, want you to see. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, one time I was reading this, the Lord told me this. He said, he said, I want you to read that in the first person. Read that as if I'm saying it to you. So I looked at that verse and I said, well, without... So if, if it's God talking directly to me, he's talking to me. He says, so without faith, it's impossible to please me. For he that comes to me must believe that I am. And that I am a rewarder of those who diligently seek me. But when I looked at it, it it's, something clicked with me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you today. And I'm, I'm going to do this quickly, I promise. Don't get off the bus yet. Hang on. This might be the best part. <laughs> so did you hear something in those verses say uh, but without faith it's impossible to please me for he that comes to me must believe that I am see when I read that verse it, the other way I read it and it says he that comes to God must believe that he is in other words that he exists that he's on planet heaven somewhere whatever and that he rewards those that diligently seek after him but when you read it this way he that comes to God must believe that uh, I am. He that comes to me must believe that I am. All of a sudden, it, it hit me. You know, God is I am. Yes. Amen. God is I am. Yes. You know what, in the church, you know what we're good at? What, what, we love to believe God, but we don't believe much in the God I am. You know, there's a scripture that says, blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. In the church, we love to celebrate who he was. Well, wasn't God good? Didn't God do great stuff? We sing songs about what God did. You know, the devil, he'd come sing with us. Oh, yeah, he was great. Man, wasn't he? Boy, he did. Remember, oh, he, remember when that old devil? Ooh, yeah, I remember that too. And the devil don't mind much if you gather where he was. If all you ever do is think about who God was. Yeah. And it's important for us to understand who he was and what he's done. The other thing the church likes to talk about is what he's going to do, who he will. <laughs> who was, we, we talk about who is to come. 
oh yeah, one day, some glad morning, you know, when this life is over, uh, uh, we're going to fly away. Uh, come on, somebody, by and by. You know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, people, they, they get all caught up in, we're going to have a revival. One day, uh, uh, he's going to pour out his spirit uh, upon all flesh. Uh, <laughs> And, and we get excited. We should. Because, you know, blessed be the Lord God who was, who is to come. But lots of people neglect who he is now. He is now. He's I am. He's I am now. Amen. He's the fulfiller of the vision that he gave you. And guess what? He's not trying to do it next week or next year. He's I am. He's I am. You know, as we've gathered in these meetings, that's what he's been for us. Not I'm coming. I am. Not I was. I am. That's why we, that's why, that's why we're jiving together. That's why these meetings are gelling because he, he's not, I'm coming, I'm going to, and he's not, I was in these meetings. He's, I am right now. And if I can encourage you with anything today, that's, and that's how we really follow the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost isn't, we're not going to do that someday. He's I am. It's right now. N none of you are leaving here today the same way that you came. You're not leaving here today the same way that you walked in the door. You're not leaving here with blinders on. You're not leaving here hopeless. You're not leaving here thinking it's impossible. With man it's impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Amen. You're going to begin to believe that the impossible is possible. He that comes to God, he that comes to me must believe that I am and that I am is a rewarder, not who diligently seeks after I was or not who diligently seeks after I will be, but diligently seeks after I am. Amen. Can I tell you one last thing before I shut this down? What is... <laughs> what are the mechanics of faith? We know what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, right? I'm going to go through this quick. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we know what faith is. We, we know, I think we know how to obtain faith. You know how to get faith? Faith comes by? Hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Amen. So faith comes by hearing. Also, we build upon our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. What a lot of people don't know is faith is impartable. When Paul talked to Timothy, he said, I recognize the faith that's in you because it started in your grandmother and then it got over on your mother and now that same faith is in you. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. This is what the Holy Ghost spoke to me tonight. Tonight, there's a measure of faith that we carry that you're going to carry out of here. Yeah. See, some of you, you walk, some of you, you, you came in here and you felt like your faith went up. It's because there's, a, there's an impartation of faith taking place here today. So, faith is impartable. So, and we know the results of faith. We know, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the uh, centurion. His servant was healed, and Jesus said it was by faith. And he said to the centurion, I've never seen such great faith, not in all of Israel. The woman with the issue of blood, your faith is made. So we know the result of faith. But what does faith actually do? What are the mechanics of faith? It's like a car. We know that we get in and we travel places in them, but how do they work? There's something that makes them work. And so most people in the body of Christ, most people, in the, we don't know the mechanics of faith. Let me tell you what faith does. You can write it down. It's not difficult. Faith speeds up time. Yes. Yes. Faith speeds up time. Yes. So, so I'll give you an example. If someone breaks a bone, if, you're, if you go to the doctor, you break a bone, you break your leg, you go to the doctor, the doctor will put a cast on it and he'll, say, he'll tell you this. In six weeks time, is it six or eight? Six to eight weeks. In six to eight weeks' time, you'll be better. 
because there's a principle that God put in the earth of, of healing. Natural, you know, naturally we will heal over a period of time. But see, God wants to take us out of the out of that boundary and out of the out of the confines of time. At one time, we weren't held back by time because we, 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 we functioned like God. So faith speeds up time. So uh, you take what would normally take six or eight weeks time, you apply faith to that, and what would normally take six to eight weeks happens in a moment of time. Because that's what faith does. Faith speeds up time. Um, there's, a, there's a story in the Bible where the prophet says, tomorrow at about this time, Shall a, fi a, a measure of flour be sold for a shekel, a measure of barley for a shekel uh, in the gate of this city? In other words, what he was prophesying is the famine's coming to an end. Well, you know what? Famines don't come to an end tomorrow at about this time unless you apply faith to a word from God. And so what would normally take a long period of time became tomorrow at about this time because faith speeds up time. See, this is, this is why I'm encouraging you in your faith. Because we walk after the Spirit by faith. Faith will accelerate you. Do you understand? We need an acceleration. Because you know what? If you look in the natural, it's too late for this country. In the natural. It's too late for Toledo. It's too late for Adrian. It's too late for Detroit. It's been too late for Detroit for years. It's too late for our nation. We started Christian. We're not a Christian nation anymore. We're a nation of many gods. So it, for us, in the natural, seems like too late. The only, the only restraining force is the Holy Ghost. And God's people applying their faith to what God has said about us concerning His Spirit. Yes. So let me give you a, a great example. <laughs> now, now listen, because this is what you're going to do. After we're going, we're going home. This ain't, we're not doing 10 weeks yet. <laughs> 20 or whatever. So here's, here's a great example. Uh, Lazarus. Y'all remember the story of Lazarus? Lazarus, Jesus' friend. <laughs> this is so crazy. Jesus' friend Lazarus is sick. His sisters send for Jesus because they're friends. This person shows up to Jesus. Jesus, your friend Lazarus, you remember the story? Your friend Lazarus is sick. They want you to come. They know if you come, he'll be better. And Jesus says this to them. He says, he says, tell them this sickness is not unto death, but unto the glory of God. And they're, they're, they're satisfied with that. They're like, oh, good. He's coming. So they go. And what does Jesus do? He waits. Yeah. He waits. For days he waits. Now listen, it's, he's not doing his taxes. It's not tax season. It's, it's not like he has more important things to do that he can't be taken away from. It's not that there's some sort of miracle that needs that. They just hang out. They sit you know, I, I'm going to preach a message one day. You know, people, people always talk about God showing up. I have a message that says, what about when he doesn't? Come on. And everybody always says, well, God always shows up. Well, listen, Jesus, Jesus let Lazarus, his friend, die. And that was his friend. Yeah. Oh, oh, to be a friend with Jesus, Amen. And for no good reason, other than the sickness was not unto death, but unto the glory of God. Yeah. Lazarus is dead. Jesus tells his disciples, you remember, let's go, let's go see Lazarus. And, and, and they say, well, Lord, you know, we was just there and they almost killed you. He said, well, Lazarus, you know, he's, he's sleeping. So, uh, well, Lord, if he's sleeping, we don't want to bother him. He's like, he's dead, you idiots. Let's go. We got to work the work while it's, you know, the whole story. And so they're like, and then one of them says, well, you know, Thomas, I think it's Thomas. Well, let's go die with him. So they all head out and they're approaching. Are y'all still with me? Stay with me. Oh, you're going to like this. <laughs> if you don't shout over this, I'm going to be mad. 
<laughs> I'm just playing. <clears throat> so he gets to Beth. He gets out of the outskirts of Bethany, and Lazarus' his sister meets him. He's Lazarus is dead. She's you know she's beside herself. Jesus, <laughs> you know the story right? Jesus, if you would have gotten here sooner, my brother wouldn't have died. <laughs> but I know that he will. Uh, that you know, I know that you 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 know all things. You can do all things. And Jesus looks at her. He says, "Listen, your brother will live again." And she says, "I know he will. In time." I know that's not exactly what she said. She said, "In the resurrection of the dead." But what she was saying was. It, given enough time, you know what? Given enough time, how many of you all have just been giving it time? We can't keep giving it time. I know, I know, I know he'll come back and he'll be raised from the dead in time, and then Jesus, ooh, then Jesus says something that's awesome. He looks at her and he's, what does he say? I am. Not I will be, not I was. He says, I am. What does he say he is? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not even the best part of it. Have you ever, have you ever thought about that? He said, I am the resurrection. How could he be the resurrection when he had not yet been resurrected? I'll tell you how. By faith, Jesus went through time and he took an event that would happen in a tomb that he would be put in, that he would resurrect from. And he, he, he went through time, he got resurrection power, and he threw it into the tomb of Lazarus, and by faith, Lazarus came back from the dead. Hallelujah. Jesus being there. Amen. Amen. You know what? Everything we have need of is not going to be at our disposal. It's at our disposal now by faith. Stand up all over the place, everybody. Hallelujah. Did you receive something here today? Oh, man. What a great time we've had this week. Boy, I tell you, I feel the presence of God. You know what I think I want to do? I, I feel, I've, I know in my spirit that I'm, I'm, to, I'm to pray for some, but before I do that, I, I want to I say this. If you're here today, we've not really had an altar. I've led people to Christ this week just because I pulled them out and felt like I was over at Independence Dam or something, pulling out, catching one fish at a time, you know, one fish at a time. <laughs> That's where me and my uncle used to go fishing. But there are some of you here today, maybe you're not serving the Lord with all of your heart. You're not living for Jesus. Listen, if you're here and you're not serving the Lord, today's your day. You need to get your heart right with God. You say, Brother Ziggy, I've, I've been in church for a long time, but I, I just don't, I, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. There's some of you are not in fellowship with God. Maybe you're not out there running around and doing drugs or drinking or whatever. But you're certainly not in fellowship with God the way that you know that he desires for you to be. And some of you, you need to renew your vows to Jesus. You need to recommit yourself to the Lord. Amen. So if you're here today and you're not 100% surrendered to the Lord, if you're not living for him like you need to be, if you're, if you're away from God, maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus. Maybe you're here and you're like, I've never given my life to Jesus, and I've, I've never seen the value in it. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not a religious person. I'm not, one time Ted and I were 
talking to another pilot at an airport. He landed an airplane there, and Ted was talking to him. He's talking to me about my airplane, and Ted said something about Jesus and asked him if he knew the Lord, and he says, well, I'm not a religious nut. Ted just looked at him and said, well, you have to be halfway nuts about something to get in a little airplane and fly it around. He said, you're going to be somebody's nut. You might as well be Jesus' nut. And Ted, Ted, don't let no one get one over on him. Ted says, you're going to be foolish for somebody. Jesus, he says, I'm a fool for Jesus. Whose fool are you? <clears throat> well, that guy didn't want to talk to us no more. But anyway, <clears throat> maybe you're here and you think this is all crazy. You know, we might be, but there's only one way to find out. You know, if we're right, if what we're saying is right, then you need a Savior. You need for God to touch you. You know what? If, if you're right and there is no God and all of this is foolish and we're just a bunch of crazies, then guess what? We still had fun. We still had fun. And we didn't have to puke our guts up after it was all over with. We had joy and we had peace. Amen. We loved one another. Amen. We prayed for one another. Amen. So if we're wrong, we have absolutely nothing to lose. Amen. But if you're wrong, then you're going to live in darkness and, and, and absent from God and away from the life of God. Listen, today, today you need to surrender your heart to Jesus. If you're here today and you've either never accepted Jesus or you're not living probably the way you should, you're not in fellowship or uh, whatever, whatever it is. I'll, I'll just say this. If the Spirit of God is dealing with you today to be at this altar and to rededicate yourself to the Lord Jesus, then I want you to get out of your chair. I want you to come down here and stand with me and pray uh, with me uh, to, uh, to, to dedicate your life to the Lord Jesus. Is there anyone? Come on. If you're here and you need prayer, come. Come and stand. <clears throat> come on. Yeah. Amen. Come on. Get down here. I want everyone that needs prayer here. Come on. Come on, Jennifer. Come down this way. Stand with us. Come on. Is there anyone else? I want you to turn to the people around you. Ask them. Say, do you need to be up there? If you need to be up there, I'll go with you. Tell them. I'll go with you. If you're afraid to go by yourself, I'll go with you. Bring them down here and we'll pray. Let's make sure. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. Where did you ladies come from? Where did you Toledo. come from? From Toledo. Toledo. Yep. So you didn't have to come too far, did you? No. no. Y'all was in, he was in Holland. Yeah, he was in Holland. Yes. What, what happened to you? What did the Lord do for you? Yes, and the Lord straightened you out, and you're still straight. Thank God. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Listen, we're going to pray. We're going to pray with these that are here. I want, I want everybody in this place to pray with us. And it doesn't matter. Listen, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. You know why you're here. You know what brought you to this altar. So we're going to pray together. We're going to ask the Lord to do a work in you. And uh, I want you to, I don't want you to pray out of your head. I want you to pray out of that drawing of, of God's spirit that brought you to this altar. And uh, say this when you say, Jesus, I come to you. All of us, let's say, I come to you right now, Lord. And I surrender my life to you. Take me in your hands. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood. I surrender all that I am, all that I have to you. Fill me full of your spirit so I can live in victory from today forward. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for taking me. Thank you for filling me. Thank you for saving me. Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen.
Now, those of you that are here, I want you to lift your hands to the Lord Jesus. And I'm going to pray for you. And like I, like I said, I heard the Lord saying that there's going to be a tremendous impartation that took place here today. Some of you are going to leave here with a greater measure of faith than what you came in with. And it's, it's, going, it's going to be that, impart, that, imp, that imparted faith. That faith that maybe you didn't, maybe you, uh, uh, you didn't uh, have to quote a bunch of refrigerator scriptures for it to be built up or whatever. But, <clears throat> but God's imparting something. He's depositing something in you that's going to help you to live a spirit-led life. So you're, you're gonna, I'm going to pray that he'll fill you full of his spirit. Now listen, don't, don't be in a hurry. Let God do whatever it is that he wants to do. So, listen, some of you, if, if you, uh, he, well, I'm, I'm not even going to say. There, there's some of you, he's going to touch you in certain ways. and You just need to let him. You just need to let God have his way with you. So whatever it takes, if he sticks you to the floor, if he sticks you to the wall, if he sticks you to the ceiling, if you, if, if you get drunk in the Holy Ghost, if you get joy, if you, if you, whatever, however it is that he chooses to touch you. If, if, if you stand here and you don't feel a thing or whatever, however the Lord deals with you, just receive it today in the name of Jesus. God, God's touching you, sister. I loose the fire of God's spirit on you right now. In the name of Jesus. Now, I'm going to pray for, I'll start down here since I pray for this lady here. Lord, touch, touch each one of these. Hang on to this. Somebody hang on to Receive. In the name of Jesus. Lord, touch each one of these. Now, in the name of Jesus. May I so bold. Yeah, get you double dose, sister. Hey, yes, sir. Double dose. Anasaya, oh, Hey, Amen. 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 Touch Moroso Mongle now. Rasa Mande, Rasubene now. In his secretary, Nana Mare Sebene, Elecrige Begelegisa Kerigoriase, Horasana Manjinekere. I thank you for it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in these. Now, that lady that probably thought I forgot about her. Did I ask your name before? Corey. Corey. <laughs> Come here, Corey. I'm going to pray for you right quick. <laughs> Are you serving the Lord with all of your heart? You living for him with everything that's in you? Everybody could do better. Do you go to church somewhere? On occasion. So you, you, you haven't been really going? God, I thank you for Corey. I thank you, God, that you've, you have begun a good work in her. And Lord, your word says that he who has begun a good work is faithful to complete it. Amen. Is faithful to complete it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I hear the Lord saying that you feel like if you let him get, too, get a hold of you too strong that it'll ruin your life. That he'll ruin your fun. But I, but I hear God saying this. God says he's not into ruining anything. He says he's into renewing. Yeah. Not ruining, renewing. And I, I, hear, I hear the Lord saying this. He says it's his desire to renew your faith in him, to renew your trust in him, to renew your trust in others. I hear God saying that the devil has worked overtime to build uh, in you mistrust for you to not to trust any, any person, especially, especially, uh, uh, especially men, to mistrust and to, and to uh, be leery of everybody. But I, but I hear God saying this. He says all that has caused you is a bunch of unrest. God says you've been through great unrest. The Lord says that uh, 
The Lord says that it's, uh, it's affected you physically. I hear God saying that there have been a time or two that you got reports that if you didn't change something, that you were going to do permanent damage to yourself, that, that, uh, that, um, that you wouldn't be able to recover from the things that, would, that you would do to harm you. But I hear God saying this. I hear the Lord saying that his hand is on you and he's brought you to this place because he says he doesn't want to ruin you. He wants to renew you. He wants to renew you. Someone give her a tissue. He wants to renew you. And so, I hear, I hear God saying that there, was, there were some that were uh, an example to you of uh, Christians, and, but they weren't a good example. And I hear the Lord saying that you thought, man, if that's what being a Christian is, I don't want to be one. But I, but I hear the Lord, I hear the Lord saying this. He says, he says, you need to look to me. He, he tell me to tell you this. He, he says that this is what God says. I've always been good to you. I have never been bad to you. The Lord says men, he says men have done stupid things, but the Lord says, he says, anytime I've come to you, the Lord says, I have rescued you. I have saved you. The Lord says, I have brought you, uh, I've brought you peace. The Lord says, I brought you peace in times. The Lord says, when it was storming all around you. God says, when you should have been consumed by the storm, the Lord says, I kept you. I kept you from being consumed by the storm. The Lord says, when, uh, he said, when you should have met your demise, the Lord said, I kept you from your demise. The Lord says, he says this, he says, um, he says, it's time. He says, it's time for you to surrender to him. It's time for you to surrender wholly to him. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, I surrender today. Touch me today. Fill me with your spirit today. Change me today. In Jesus' name. Lord, I, I lay my hands on her. I pray, God, that you fill her full of your spirit. Fill her full from the top of her head to the soles of her feet in the name of Jesus. I loose the fire of the Holy Ghost. I loose the fire of the Holy Ghost. And God, I thank you that today you're bringing about a change. You're bringing about a change that will set her on course, Lord, to greater things in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's awesome. Praise God. Amen. She, she wants to sit down because she can't hardly stand up. Thank God. <laughs> you know, when, when, the, when the Holy Ghost gets to move, it, you just got to let him move. Amen. Yeah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, pray in the spirit with me for a minute longer. Shania. Para saporo bongle, ene triesa paya dre eje, a crie do moro moseba, ar para driese pede gijedri gitri kiste carafa, fariende ne mese calabre edri ise prebice, nana soyobro, barre sicere, fruna majana, malas amen, he's working in here. Receive today, receive today, receive today, receive today. Receive today. Receive today. Receive today. Ini masa korodrie te beheda. Tonum romo se bane de chea. Arfere direct de behedrie tie. Oh, yamande de mansaya. Arbeda. I'm going to come around. Uh, that way we don't crowd up up here, but Lord, I, I, I lay my hands on each one. I pray, God, there'll be an impartation of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God impart a greater measure of faith. Ho, se membre norisa to each one. Ho, re se mande borro soboyo. Ho, rasama baradre echi raga danasai manamano hara osopoye mene koresa hara borro soboyo hara shedena hele kalisa ho manasibiera 
Marachoboroseboa in the Masikea in the name of Jesus. Monia Hele Sekedo and Efruba Ara Sikea. Ho Ramane Mesekede. Ho Resia Labaya. Ho Ramache Kichere Be Ere Besia. Ho Ramahana Mandine Meze. Shayamara Base Kichebe Ede. Get it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Now, in the name of Jesus. Now, in the name of Jesus. Menesuya bra agri ektaya. Maranongo rosoya borosifreda. Mea jacara base keche de boya. Hora masi heleheya. Alegria <laughs> deva. Hey, I'll give you some of that too. Glory to God. <laughs> See, I get a, I get all around these girls. The fire of God comes on them real easy. Y'all, y'all get that warmth that settles over your shoulders and over your head. And you like, let it get on you. Amen. Let it get on you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hele so ramana bara shegere mondere masse. And you just hang in here with, in with me for a minute. I thank you, Father. Lord, uh, make a deposit in each one. God, may they carry out of these meetings a greater measure of the anointing, a greater measure, God, of your spirit being made manifest in and through them in the name of Jesus. A greater measure of faith. A greater measure of faith. Soromo sekere do rabanda. Haranara ma seberegia. Bara soboro. I know I didn't ask y'all if I could do this, but I'm assuming it's okay. Ere sobrama. Hara corre sebenge. Now, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Haruria haramana. Hara suprebere. Koromo seleboleka. Haram romo senemegia. Hora kalal giaramante. Horosomondo. Borosebea. Henechia. Boroso corre. Harandorama. Menekea. Ooh. Sheberehia. Horosoba. Now. Hanamashie keregea. Horosobongele jega. Bara sebena. Ho regejina. Ho. Hey Samoya. Mora mahanaya. Ho, 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 ho. Menesuya. Borok socorro bose. Bele cariase. Ereshina mana masse. Nene masa. Double dose. Double dose in the name of Jesus. Double dose on you, my sister. Woo! In the name of Jesus. Double. Ha ha. So Ramona mahaya boresa. Manasha, Haradora, Gabrielle in the name of Jesus. Kele Suprea, Jerry. Who? Haya Somomro. How Ramose. You got yours right in the beginning, didn't you? Hey! Maya. You will, won't you? Yes, Somomro. Yes, Somara. Bless him, Jesus. I thank you for it. Oh, Ramangele Jaya. Hari Savana Mande Nevea. Marado. Lord bless Pastor. Ko ya mare. Bless Pastor Jerry, God, in the name of Jesus. Mora mo sekete mora hadaya. Lele mora samana. Efredia. Oh, touch Brother Joe. Kore semengre. Mori mo ho ramai. Mana se edemongele jay. Rantene carise. Elvia ramante. Horo soboro, merishehia, haradre egia tomo, hanama fredo, mene unama seco toromo, melegriisa, haratan embreea, mara shaboro, mene seke. I, I, hear, I hear the Lord tell me, tell you this, Joe. He says things are accelerating around you. The Lord says that, um, of course, there's ones that try to get you to slow down and you don't. And, and they're concerned for you, but he says their concerns are unfounded. He says, because my hand is on you, the Lord says, I'm accelerating. He says, the pace at which I'm moving you and working with you. 
He says, he says, you've said it out of your mouth. You've said the time is short. The Lord said, if men knew how short the time was, they'd be busy. They'd be busy every moment of every day. God says, I've dropped it in you. He says, you know it. He says, you carry the urgency. God says, as you begin to touch others, they're going to carry the urgency. The, the, Lord, the Lord says, it's been a long time since you've sensed in your spirit and since you've seen with your eyes and heard with your ears, I'm talking about in the spirit, the things that you're uh, be, becoming aware of now, the Lord says that he's showing you that things are beginning to wind up, things are beginning to crank up, that God's getting ready to do something that goes way beyond anything that, you ever, that you've ever witnessed, that you've ever seen yourself. The Lord says, he told you it was coming. In fact, God says, in a time of great blessing and great revival, the Lord said, there's coming a time that's even greater than this time. And God's, God told you, he made you a promise. The Lord said, you would see it coming. God said, you would see it coming and you'd taste of it. You know, the Lord told me to tell you, God says, you tasting of it right now. Amen. Amen. The Lord says, and there's more to come. God says, you're not, the Lord says, you're not through partaking of that which he's going to do in this last hour. The Lord said, I made your promise and I aim to keep it. God says, the urgency's high in you. He says, because it's, it's necessary. God says, you got to be urgent about it in order to be a partaker of it. But the Lord says, you'll, he says, you'll see much more in the next six to eight months touched by your life and by your ministry, the Lord says, than have been touched God, God says you're going to see more touched in the next six or eight months that have been touched in the last 20 years. Even though there have been many touched in 20 years, the Lord says, I'm going to turn. God, God says you're going, you're going to be an explosion going somewhere to happen. Yeah. Amen. You're going to be a fire going somewhere to burn. And the Lord says, I'm going to open up the door for you to go too. He says, I'm going to see to it that I get you everywhere you need to be to ignite the flames and the fire of revival in the hearts of men, in the hearts of my people. In Jesus' name, I thank you for it, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hear you, I hear these words coming out of your mouth a lot. See, I told you. See, I told you. I told you all to get ready. I told you all it was coming. And, and the Lord says, you're going to be able to say that, not with malice or, or uh, contempt or anything like that, but just as an announcement to say, it's here. Yeah. It's, it's upon us. Amen. God is moving and he's working and he's doing what he said. Hallelujah. Amen. I feel privileged to have met you this week, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> In part, Lord, pour out of your spirit. Lord, pour out of your spirit on my brother, on my sister. Hallelujah. <laughs> Munasero brure, arvidri ese crescina, le crie se peda, moro sombrono, mel belelice premesta da frona. Barra cre engelingia, rantana ma pre. I hear, I hear the Lord tell me to tell y'all not to be afraid that you'll work too hard. The Lord says the work, he says, he says the, uh, the labor that you'll do in this hour, he says, will hardly seem like work. It'll hardly seem like labor. Uh, but, but the Lord says this, he says, uh, I'm going to put, he says, I'm going to put more on your plate than you think that you're capable of handling. But he says, I want you to have confidence. He says that, um, I'm going to surround you with people, not like people from the past, people that would uh, take advantage, people that would, uh, divide people that would split, uh, people that would hurt, uh, people that would, uh, I wouldn't, would have no care and would have no thought of inflicting pain and hurt upon uh, God's people. The Lord says, I'm bringing those of a like heart and of a like spirit uh, to join uh, together with you in order to help you to do the work that the Lord's placed in your heart to do. So I hear God saying this. He says, uh, he says you're going to get 
busy, but he says, don't be afraid. He said, you won't stay by yourself. The Lord says, I'll send help. He said, in fact, I'll send so much help, the Lord says, that I'll alleviate you of the burden of doing the things the Lord says that you've never desired or even had um, a great ability to do. And the Lord says, I'll send people to do that. Uh, I'll send people to do that work so that you can be about the things that you've always loved to do and desired to do and wanted to do. Amen. So I lose that to you today in the name of Jesus, and I thank God for it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Lord, touch Cameron. Glory to God. Lord, touch her today in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. Cameron, the Lord's giving you a voice, a loud voice. Your voice hadn't been loud in the natural in, in recent times and in recent days. But I hear God saying that he says, Uri Samacha. He says, slowly, he says. And, and it seems like it's been slow. But I hear God saying this, you're going to get radical. Ooh, you're going to get, you're going to get extremely radical to the point where the Lord says, there's going to be one day that you're going to be, uh, you're going to be communicating and shouting and, and speaking on, in a way that your mind isn't going to comprehend what's happening. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to uh, think that what you're doing is, is quiet, that you're doing it silently to yourself, but you're going to find that it was out loud where others could hear. The Lord says, the Lord says that you've been silent for a long time. God says, God says you've been silent because the Lord says it's always been my will to use your voice for you to not be silent but to decree and to declare the things that I've put in your heart. He says, he says, uh, you're, he says you'll never give up on it. You know it's in, it's in your heart. It, it, it gives you a little bit of anxiety in the natural. God ain't giving you anxiety. The anxiety, the source of that anxiety is you. But I hear the Lord saying, you don't have any reason to be anxious. He says, you don't have any reason to be fearful or afraid. The Lord says, uh, he says, in your heart, uh, you, it's your desire to do my will. And the Lord says, because it's my will for you to be a voice, the Lord says, you'll embrace it with joy. And he says, you'll receive it with gladness. He says, and when the time comes, there'll, there'll come a time when people said, I never heard you speak. And they said, we long for the days that you will be quiet again because you, you won't leave us alone. But the, but the Lord says this. He says, for good reason. He says, he says, you'll tell them, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And there'll, some, there'll be some that won't want to hear it, but God says there'll be others that'll run to Jesus because of the words they hear you speak in Jesus' name. I thank you for it, Father. I'm coming for all of you. I won't miss any of you, I promise. And it's shuyara baraso. Yalagari segele. Henemushe kerebrahia sataya. Mara somondo. Haradangele jaya. I hear, I hear God saying that there's go, there will come a time, and, and your, 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 your father and your mother, they're already prepared you for the time that you will, uh, that you will uh, take the helm and really, and really take the, uh, over to, to, do the, to, be the, uh, to be the lead in this church and in this work. I hear God saying there'd be some that might try to oppose it, but the Lord says they're not opposing men if they oppose this. The Lord says they're opposing me. And so I hear the Lord saying, I hear the Lord saying anyone who rises against you rises against me. The Lord says you're not going anywhere. That's what he told me to tell you. So he says, he says this, he says, I'm settling some things. The Lord says, uh, the Lord says, I'm, I'm bringing a confidence in you that you'll know that you won't, uh, that you're not going to steer the ship and run it aground and steer it in a direction that will, uh, that will cause it to not uh, complete the journey. But I hear God saying this. I hear God saying he's going to give you a way to do it that some will swear will not be the right way. The Lord says, I've already been talking to you. And there are ones that already, they're, they're, uh, they're getting kind of bristled up over some of the things that are in your heart. 
but I hear the Lord saying, don't pay no attention to them. You just keep, you just keep talking to me. The Lord says, I'll continue to lead you. I'll continue to guide you. I'll continue to show you my way. God says, I've got a new thing breaking forth in here. There's going to come a day when, when people are going to come through these doors and they're going to be, uh, they're going to be, uh, people that, um, that wouldn't have heard. God's going to send people to this place that wouldn't have heard the message of your father that wouldn't have accepted the uh, method of his ministry. But the Lord says, the Lord says, everything he's going to do in you, he says, he's going to do it in the same, in a, in a similar, uh, fa- the, 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 the anointing is going to be very similar, very, it's going to be, it's going to be extremely powerful. God says, you're just, you're, you're just a different uh, vessel. You just look different to them. And because you look different to them, the Lord says, they're going to be more accepting of it. Amen. But I hear, but I hear God. I hear God saying this. Just a shift. Amen. Hallelujah. Pastor Larry, you're Hallelujah. where he's somewhere around here, isn't he? Your work isn't finished. It's not over. It's not done. He's not done. But there's a. There really is a shift that's going on in the spirit. And I hear the Holy Ghost saying it needs to happen. It's got to happen. In order for the Lord to do what he wants to do here, there's got to be that shift. And so he says it's happening. Now some people say, well, when? You know, when? When's this happening? Now. It's, it's happening now. It's already begun. It's already begun. Some said, I'm ready. The Lord says, uh, some says, I'm not ready. The Lord says, ready or not. Here I come. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So I lose that to you in the name of Jesus. I lose that to y'all in the name of Jesus. Now listen, I'm going to tell y'all that because some people are like, oh, Brother Ziggy, that seems like that could be a word that was a little bit, you know, if people are bristly or whatever. Well, listen, if you don't want to hear the word of the Lord, quit praying. Lord, talk to us. If you don't want God to talk to you, if you want God to tell you what you want to hear, then pray that way. But don't go praying, Lord, speak to us, if you don't want God to tell you some things you don't want to hear. Because if you ask God to talk to you, I've asked God to talk to me, and he said some things I didn't like. I was like, say something else. <laughs> he did. He just said it a different way. <laughs> he said the same thing a different way. I was like, well, that felt better. Praise God. Anyway, man, he said, see, you've been stirred up big time in this revival. It's like something, do you underwent a transformation? I hear God saying, y'all two will never be the same after this week. I, I hear God saying that a work that he did in, ooh, Shemeda. I hear God saying that he's, re, he's renewed and he's revived a vision, a vision that you began to get in Bible school. You begin to see something in Bible school and you've never seen it come to fruition in the natural. It's always just been a dream that you carried in your heart. And you weren't sure how you'd get to that place. But I hear God saying that he's revived that dream. He's revived that fire. I hear the Lord saying that he's, he's bringing the both of you into a place. The both of you are going to... Now, it's never that y'all aren't on the same page. It's just the both of you wonder, how will it happen? Because it doesn't seem like it's possible. But I, I hear the Lord saying, the impossible is becoming possible right now. What, what men would swear... Would, what, what men swore would never happen, the Lord says, is about to happen. It's about to happen. Amen. Shenemara. Oh, Sarah, Kalishebro, I loose the fire of God on you in the name of Jesus. Menesea. Oh, ho, 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 Ajamano, <laughs> I hear God saying he's settling some things in your life, in your mind, in your heart, in your house. I hear God saying this is a season of settling. <laughs> you know, when a house settles, it makes noise. So I hear the Lord saying that there have been some noises made, some noises that drew your attention here and drew your attention there. 
but nothing came of the noise. But I, but I hear God saying this. You got to know, he says, that I'm establishing you. He says, you can't be afraid. Don't, he says, don't fear. He says, don't fear that you're going to miss the boat, that you're going to miss the train. The Lord says, you'll not miss a thing as long as you tuck into me, as long as you tuck into my spirit. The, uh, you say, God, I don't, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to make a mistake. I hear the Lord saying, as long as you follow the Holy Ghost, the Lord says, you won't make a mistake. God says, God says uh, your care and, and the mercy that God's put in your heart for others has you hearing sounds that, that, uh, that uh, d distract you from what the Lord is saying. I hear the Lord saying this. He says, he says, uh, he says he's made you compassionate. The Lord says he's given you a tremendous gift of mercy. Uh, the Lord says because of that, he says, you fear what will happen to others if you, uh, if you move in a direction, um, and if you move in a direction that is different than the direction that you moved in in the past. But I hear the Lord saying this, he's going to move you in a direction that's different. There's, you're, there's no getting out of it. God says you've come too far to go back. The Lord says you've reached the point of no return. God says you're going to find that the things that you, that you have said in your heart, Lord, if you'll fix this, if you'll fix that, if this will go away, if that will go away, if, if you'll heal this, if you'll heal that, if you'll do these things, then that'll make it easier. The Lord says, yeah, it'd make it easier, but God says you walk by faith, not by sight. The Lord says as you step out in faith, he says there will come a balm of healing and a balm of health. The Lord says I will rush in and I will cause strength to come into the physical. Uh, God says, where there's been no strength, the Lord says, but he says, he says, uh, uh, you need to obey. <laughs> Amen. You need to obey. He says, he's not, it's not a rebuke. He just says, there's some things that he's saying and some ways that he's leading. And you don't want anyone, you don't want, you want everyone to be satisfied with what the Lord told you. The Lord says, no one's going to be satisfied with what I told you. He says, you won't even be satisfied with what I told you. The Lord says, but it will satisfy me. He says, when you do my will. And he says, and it'll be a blessing to you. He says, into your whole house, if you'll, if you'll respond in obedience to me. So Lord, I thank you for it. I reckon you needed that. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I'm almost done. <laughs> Just a few more. I hear God saying that the image that you have of your mother is going to change. I hear the Lord saying that you're seeing her through the filter of her past and you've not yet been able to see her for what God has, uh, what the future that God has for. I hear the Lord saying that you're going to begin to see her not in the light of where she is or where she was, but you're going to begin to see her in the light of what God has called her to be. Um, I, I, I hear God saying that, uh, um, that there's nothing, there, there's not really anything you can do except for when the Lord begins to change your perception that you accept the, that you accept how the Lord is, is, is doing and how he is saying, I, I hear, uh, I hear the Lord, I hear the Lord also tell me, tell you this. He says, you've got to tuck into Jesus strong. You, ca you can't allow yourself to be distracted by anything. I hear the Lord saying that, uh, that uh, you hit a lull, like you hit a place in the spirit where it just seemed like it was a, you know what a lull is, right? Kind of a, uh, where things slowed down, where it didn't seem like things were quite as exciting and everything just kind of slowed, like you was walking through, like you were walking through mud and it just, everything just slowed down. The Lord says, I'm about to speed things up again. The Lord says the lull, he said, came, but he says that lull, he said, was never intended uh, to drag you away from things. God said that you had married yourself to things that you had uh, uh, brought close to you. 
And the Lord says, you've backed off of some things and you've, and you've kind of just distanced yourself from them because of this law. But I hear God saying, embrace those things again. He says, cause I'm about to speed things up. He says, and you're about to be set ablaze. You're about to get on fire big time. But I, but I do hear the Lord saying this. He says, it is vital for you to begin to see through the eyes of the spirit, the image that God sees of your mother. He says, because it'll be vital not only for her, but for you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Jennifer, give me your hand one more time. Lord bless Jennifer. I thank you for her, God. I thank you for her, Lord, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father. I thank you. And I'm going to say this to you, and I'm telling you the truth. I mean this with all of my heart. Out of all the people I've met over 30-something years of ministry, you're one of the most amazing things I've seen God do. The Lord has done great things for you. Amen. Oh, big time. And, uh, and I, and I'm telling you, I know that I know that I'm going to get to see the finished work. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. Lord, I thank you. Bless my sister. <laughs> he does bless you, doesn't he? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, continue to pour out your spirit upon her. Lord, I thank you for bless these that have been uh, willing to be a blessing to us in the name of Jesus. Ooh, yes, amen. Haradru sekechebeda. For the glory of God, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Oh, see there? Wasn't that sweet? <laughs> Thank God. Hallelujah. Well, how many of you received something today? Okay. Lord, we thank you that you're going to work with those doctors. And God, that you, our, prayer, our first prayer is that before he ever gets there, uh, you do a work. Yes. And Lord, let these doctors have enough sense that when they look at him, yes. they know that you've yes. begun a good work. Yes. But Father, I pray that he'll be at peace. <clears throat> I pray that the family will be at peace. Yes. Yes. And Lord, we thank you that your will, perfect will is going to be done in this young man's body. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 What's your name? Micah. Micah. I love you, Micah. <laughs> I, I think I make Micah nervous, man. He he be, he be looking away. He's not hangry tonight. Though. Oh, he's not hangry. You you brought you a snack, Micah. Did you bring you a snack tonight? <laughs> thank God. Listen, I love you. I appreciate you. I thank God for you. Pray for us. I think we're gonna go ahead and blast out of here tonight and go home. But um, we love you guys and we appreciate you. I thank God for the privilege that I had to be here with you all this week. What a wonderful, wonderful time in the Holy Ghost we have had. I'm so grateful to God that we were able to spend, uh, I feel like Mr. Rogers up here. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> I have always wanted to have a neighbor. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. But anyway, honestly, I, God's done something special here. He really has. If you, if you haven't realized that or recognized that, I don't know what's going to happen as a result of what's happened here, but something significant has taken place. And uh, it doesn't matter that TBN wasn't here to broadcast. It doesn't matter that God TV didn't have their truck over here. None of that matters. All that matters is that we've come and we've done the will of God and something moved over the community of Bowling Green. Amen. Something has shifted. Something has shifted over you. Amen. Something has shifted over your life. So uh, I love you. Uh, pray for me. Uh, and here, I'm going to tell you how to pray because some people are like, how, how do you want us to pray? Pray this way. Pray, Lord, don't let Brother Ziggy jack up what you're doing in his life. Don't let him jack it up. <laughs> Just keep him straight and don't let him mess anything up because that's really, you know, all that it is is if I, if I mess it up, that's the only thing that can keep it from happening. So, so uh, that's how you can pray for me. That's the best prayer you could pray for me. Uh, I think we're going to be back in the Ohio area. Of course, we'll be further south. Um, uh, in Springfield in September. And so keep a look on the Facebook page. If you're not a, a, a friend of mine on Facebook, friend me. Even if you're afraid, I'm going to see your stupid pictures. <laughs> friend me. I've got lots of people do stupid stuff on Facebook. But anyway, and also in the back, there's an iPad. You can enter your address and your email address and stuff. And uh, we haven't started yet the newsletter and, and whatnot that we're going to do through that. But we intend to do it. We just... We've, we've been hit and miss on getting it done since all that has taken place. We left that iPad in uh, <laughs> at Holland uh, when we left because we didn't, we didn't have any time 
Uh, they were shutting everything down. We didn't have time to even get all of our, I barely got my clothes out of the house I was staying in. So, um, but, uh, but we do uh, plan on uh, continuing to come to this area and uh, the revival tour will continue. This revival, we call it a revival tour. I don't know why I, we ended up calling it that for lack of a better term, but it's totally for what happened here uh, to, for people to encounter the fire of revival. Many people have never, have never uh, gotten in that flow of revival. And for us, typically we're at a church for, it, it won't break out for three weeks, but the Lord said, I want you to go. I want you to go places you've never been. I want you to connect with pastors where you've never been. He told me he wanted me to go to big churches and small churches. We, we go to churches where we preach to thousands of people and we go to churches like this one where it's just you know, less than a hundred people. We'll, we go wherever he tells us. But he said everywhere that we would go, that the fire of revival would touch people and people would, people would know and, they'd, and they would begin to get hungry for revival, hungry for what happens in those seven-month meetings that we have. Because, you know, usually three weeks we get a breakthrough. Man, we hit the ground running in these meetings and we have revival right from the get-go. So I, I, I want you to be, uh, uh, just keep an eye on where we're at. If you can make it, we'd love to have you. And uh, if we get a new airplane, I'll put a picture of it up for you. And uh, anyway, I love you, and I'll see you soon. Come on, brother. I th thank you so much. Yes, sir. That's right, yeah. too but uh yeah thank god for all the people that have been watching on facebook amen all right God has done a great thing, is doing a great thing, and will continue to do a great thing. Amen. First Thessalonians 5 and 19 tells us, do not quench the spirit. Hallelujah. So when we continue to, to, to go on our way, don't, don't think the revival left because Pastor Ziggy left. Bring revival to your Sunday morning service. Hallelujah. When you're going home, say, I'm in revival still. I'm in revival still. When you meet him again, we can just pick up right where we left off. There ain't no more point in making him overwork. Hallelujah. Don't overwork the man of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> he, he put in a lot of work here. You don't know what it takes to go a whole week, let alone these long revivals he does sometimes, building the groundwork just so you can receive what God has for you. Come expecting to receive. Know that he's got something for you. He's got something that is going to change your life, going to change your family, going to change your neighborhood. And go into every morning, every day, and when you wake up in the morning, say, Lord, what do you have for me to do today? What do you have for me to do today? Because he's got something for you to do. A lot of you are looking for the next thing to happen instead of asking God, what are you doing today? Because he's got a plan for your life, and it's a plan that is better than any plan you could ever make. It's a plan that will prosper you, and it will keep you in good health. Hallelujah. He said it to Jeremiah, and he'll do it for you too. Hallelujah. He's not a respecter of person. All right. Hallelujah. What was I doing? Closing? Hallelujah. God is good. Uh, I receive that word. You know, God has got a word for each and every one of us, and he, he gave us a little touch of it tonight, but don't let it die. Don't let it die because you, you, you broke off of this little uh, happening. This, this big awakening is really what it was. We, we awoken. We're revived. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We, we were already dead, so revival could start right away. Hallelujah. You didn't have to kill us. <laughs> Hallelujah. He walked into a dead church. <clears throat> I can, I can say that. I'm a, I'm a pastor here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But, but go home and, and, and continue to live and to can, continue to let the Spirit give you life and renew your mind daily. Hallelujah. Put on the mind of Christ. Let's not go back to the way we thought before we came here. Because everyone has a new way of thinking right now. And don't let it go away. All right. I love you all. Be blessed. And I hope to see you again soon.